Section 23 of the Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thornston Veblen. Chapter 10 Modern Survivals of Prowess. The leisure class lives by the industrial community rather than in it. Its relations to industry are of a pecuniary rather than an industrial kind. Admission to the class is gained by exercise of the pecuniary aptitudes, aptitudes for acquisition rather than for serviceability. There is, therefore, a continued selective sifting of the human material that makes up the leisure class, and this selection proceeds on the ground of fitness for pecuniary pursuits. But the scheme of life of the class is in large part a heritage from the past and embodies much of the habits and ideals of the earlier barbarian period. This archaic barbarian scheme of life imposes itself also on the lower orders, with more or less mitigation. In its turn, the scheme of life, of conventions, acts selectively and by education to shape the human material, and its action runs chiefly in the direction of conserving traits, habits, and ideals that belong to the early barbarian age, the age of prowess and predatory life. The most immediate and unequivocal expression of that archaic human nature which characterizes man in the predatory stage is the fighting propensity proper. In cases where the predatory activity is a collective one, this propensity is frequently called the martial spirit, or, latterly, patriotism. It needs no insistence to find assent to the proposition that in the countries of civilized Europe, the hereditary leisure class is endowed with this martial spirit in a higher degree than the middle classes. Indeed, the leisure class claims the distinction as a matter of pride, and no doubt with some grounds. War is honorable, and warlike prowess is eminently honorific in the eyes of the generality of men, and this admiration of warlike prowess is itself the best voucher of a predatory temperament in the admirer of war. The enthusiasm for war, and the predatory temper of which it is the index, prevail in the largest measure among the upper classes, especially among the hereditary leisure class. Moreover, the ostensible serious occupation of the upper class is that of government, which, in point of origin and developmental content, is also a predatory occupation. The only class which could at all dispute with the hereditary leisure class the honor of an habitual bellicose frame of mind is that of the lower class delinquents. In ordinary times, the large body of the industrial classes is relatively apathetic touching warlike interests. When unexcited, this body of the common people, which makes up the effective force of the industrial community, is rather averse to any other than a defensive fight. Indeed, it responds a little tardily even to a provocation which makes for an attitude of defense. In the more civilized communities, or rather in the communities which have reached an advanced industrial development, the spirit of warlike aggression may be said to be obsolescent among the common people. This does not say that there is not an appreciable number of individuals among the industrial classes in whom the martial spirit asserts itself obtrusively. Nor does it say that the body of the people may not be fired with martial ardor for a time under the stimulus of some special provocation, such as is seen in operation today in more than one of the countries of Europe, and for the first time in America. But except for such seasons of temporary exaltation, and except for those individuals who are endowed with an archaic temperament of the predatory type, together with a similarly endowed body of individuals among the higher and the lowest classes, the inertness of the mass of any modern civilized community in this respect is probably so great as would make war impracticable, except against actual invasion. The habits and aptitudes of the common run of men make for an unfolding of activity in other, less picturesque directions than that of war. This class difference in temperament may be due in part to a difference in the inheritance of acquired traits in the several classes, but it seems also, in some measure, to correspond with a difference in ethnic derivation. The class difference is in this respect visibly less in those countries whose population is relatively homogeneous, ethnically, than in the countries where there is a broader divergence between the ethnic elements that make up the several classes of the community. In the same connection, it may be noted that the later accessions to the leisure class in the latter countries 
in a general way, show less of the martial spirit than contemporary representatives of the aristocracy of the ancient line. These nouveaux arrivés have recently emerged from the commonplace body of the population and owe their emergence into the leisure class to the exercise of traits and propensities which are not to be classed as prowess in the ancient sense. Apart from warlike activity proper, the institution of the duel is also an expression of the same superior readiness for combat, and the duel is a leisure class institution. The duel is in substance a more or less deliberate resort to a fight as a final settlement of a difference of opinion. In civilized communities it prevails as a normal phenomenon only where there is an hereditary leisure class, and almost exclusively among that class. The exceptions are one, military and naval officers who are ordinarily members of the leisure class and who are at the same time especially trained to predatory habits of mind, and two, the lower class delinquents, who are by inheritance or training or both of a similarly predatory disposition and habit. It is only the high-bred gentlemen and the rowdy that normally resort to blows as the universal solvent of differences of opinion. The plain man will ordinarily fight only when excessive momentary irritation or alcoholic exaltation act to inhibit the more complex habits of response to the stimuli that make for provocation. He is then thrown back upon the simpler, less differentiated forms of the instinct of self-assertion, that is to say, he reverts temporarily and without reflection to an archaic habit of mind. This institution of the duel as a mode of finally settling disputes and serious questions of precedence shades off into the obligatory, unprovoked private fight as a social obligation due to one's good repute. As a leisure class usage of this kind we have, particularly, that bizarre survival of bellicose chivalry, the German student duel. In the lower or spurious leisure class of the delinquents, there is in all countries a similar, though less formal, social obligation incumbent on the rowdy to assert his manhood in unprovoked combat with his fellows. And spreading through all grades of society, a similar usage prevails among the boys of the community. The boy usually knows to nicety, from day to day, how he and his associates grade in respect of relative fighting capacity, and in the community of boys there is, ordinarily, no secure basis of reputability for anyone who, by exception, will not, or cannot, fight on invitation. All this applies especially to boys above a certain somewhat vague limit of maturity. The child's temperament does not commonly answer to this description during infancy and the years of close tutelage, when the child still habitually seeks contact with its mother at every turn of its daily life. During this earlier period there is little aggression and little propensity for antagonism. The transition from the peaceable temper to the predaceous and, in extreme cases malignant, mischievousness of the boy is a gradual one, and it is accomplished with more completeness covering a larger range of the individual's aptitudes, in some cases, than in others. In the earlier stage of his growth, the child, whether boy or girl, shows less of initiative and aggressive self-assertion and less of an inclination to isolate himself and his interests from the domestic group in which he lives, and he shows more of sensitiveness to rebuke, bashfulness, timidity, and the need of friendly human contact. In the common run of cases, this early temperament passes, by gradual but somewhat rapid obsolescence of the infantile features, into the temperament of the boy proper, though there are also cases where the predaceous futures of boy life do not emerge at all, or at the most emerge in but a slight and obscure degree. In girls, the transition to the predaceous stage is seldom accomplished with the same degree of completeness as in boys and in a relatively large proportion of cases it is scarcely undergone at all in such cases the transition from infancy to adolescence and maturity is a gradual and unbroken process of the shifting of interest from infantile purposes and aptitudes to the purposes functions and relations of adult life in the girls there is a less general prevalence of a predaceous interval in the development, and in the cases where it occurs, the predaceous and isolating attitude during the interval is commonly less accentuated. In the male child, the predaceous interval is ordinarily fairly well marked and lasts for some time, but it is commonly terminated, if at all, with the attainment of maturity. This last statement may need very material qualification. The cases are by no means rare in which the transition from the boyish to the adult temperament is not made, nor is made only partially, 
understanding by the adult temperament the average temperament of those adult individuals in modern industrial life who have some serviceability for the purposes of the collective life process and who may therefore be said to make up the effective average of the industrial community the ethnic composition of the european populations varies in some cases even the lower classes are in large measure made up of the peace disturbing dolico blonde while in others this ethnic element is found chiefly among the hereditary leisure class the fighting habit seems to prevail to a less extent among the working-class boys in the latter class of populations than among the boys of the upper classes or among those of the populations first named if this generalization as to the temperament of the boy among the working classes should be found true on a fuller and closer scrutiny of the field it would add force to the view that the bellicose temperament is in some appreciable degree a race characteristic it appears to enter more largely into the makeup of the dominant upper class ethnic type the dolico blonde of the european countries than into the subservient lower class types of men which are conceived to constitute the body of the population of the same communities the case of the boy may seem not to bear seriously on the question of the relative endowment of prowess with which the several classes of society are gifted but it is at least of some value as going to show that this fighting impulse belongs to a more archaic temperament than that possessed by the average adult man of the industrious classes in this as in many other features of child life the child reproduces temporarily and in miniature some of the earlier phases of the development of adult man under this interpretation the boy's predilection for exploit and for isolation of his own interest is to be taken as a transient reversion to the human nature that is normal to the earlier barbarian culture the predatory culture proper in this respect as in much else the leisure class and the delinquent class character shows a persistence into adult life of traits that are normal to childhood and youth and that are likewise normal or habitual to the earlier stages of culture unless the difference is traceable entirely to a fundamental difference between persistent ethnic types the traits that distinguish the swaggering delinquent and the punctilious gentleman of leisure from the common crowd are in some measure marks of an arrested spiritual development they mark an immature phase as compared with the stage of development attained by the average of the adults in the modern industrial community and it will appear presently that the puerile spiritual makeup of these representatives of the upper and the lowest social strata shows itself also in the presence of other archaic traits than this proclivity to ferocious exploit and isolation as if to leave no doubt about the essential immaturity of the fighting temperament we have bridging the interval between legitimate boyhood and adult manhood the aimless and playful but more or less systematic and elaborate disturbances of the peace in vogue among schoolboys of a slightly higher age in the common run of cases these disturbances are confined to the period of adolescence they recur with decreasing frequency and acuteness as youth merges into adult life and so they reproduce in a general way in the life of the individual the sequence by which the group has passed from the predatory to a more settled habit of life in an appreciable number of cases the spiritual growth of the individual comes to a close before he emerges from the spiral phase in these cases the fighting temper persists through life those individuals who in spiritual development eventually reach man's estate therefore ordinarily pass through a temporary archaic phase corresponding to the permanent spiritual level of the fighting and sporting men different individuals will of course achieve spiritual maturity and sobriety in this respect in different degrees and those who fail of the average remain as an undissolved residue of crude humanity in the modern industrial community and as a foil for that selective process of adaptation which makes for heightened industrial efficiency and the fullness of life of the collectivity this arrested spiritual development may express itself not only in indirect participation by adults in youthful exploits of ferocity but also indirectly in aiding and abetting disturbances of this kind on the part of younger persons it thereby furthers the formation of habits of ferocity which may persist in the later life of the growing generation and so retard any movement in the direction of a more peaceable effective temperament on the part of the community if a person so endowed with a proclivity for exploits is in a position to guide the development of habits in the adolescent members of the community the influence which he exerts in the direction of conservation and reversion to prowess may be very considerable 
This is the significance, for instance, of the fostering care latterly bestowed by many clergymen and other pillars of society among boys' brigades and similar pseudo-military organizations. The same is true of the encouragement given to the growth of college spirit, college athletics, and the like in the higher institutions of learning. These manifestations of the predatory temperament are all to be classed under the head of exploit. They are partly simple and unreflected expressions of an attitude of ferocity, partly activities deliberately entered upon with a view to gaining repute for prowess. Sports of all kinds are of the same general character, including prize fights, bull fights, athletics, shooting, angling, yachting, and games of skill, even where the element of destructive physical efficiency is not an obtrusive feature. Sports shade off from the basis of hostile combat, through skill, to cunning and chicanery, without its being possible to draw a line at any point. The ground of an addiction to sports is an archaic spiritual constitution, the possession of the predatory emulative propensity in a relatively high potency. A strong proclivity to adventuresome exploit and to the infliction of damage is especially pronounced in those employments which are in colloquial usage specifically called sportsmanship. And the first part of chapter 10. Section 24 of the Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. Second part of Chapter 10 Modern Survivals of Prowess. It is perhaps truer, or at least more evident, as regards sports than as regards the other expressions of predatory emulation already spoken of, that the temperament which inclines men to them is essentially a boyish temperament. The addiction to sports, therefore, in a peculiar degree, marks an arrested development of the man's moral nature. This peculiar boyishness of temperament in sporting men immediately becomes apparent when attention is directed to the large element of make-believe that is present in all sporting activity. Sports share this character of make-believe with the games and exploits to which children, especially boys, are habitually inclined. Make-believe does not enter in the same proportion into all sports, but it is present in a very appreciable degree in all. It is apparently present in a larger measure in sportsmanship proper and in athletic contests than in set games of skill of a more sedentary character, although this rule may not be found to apply with any great uniformity. It is noticeable, for instance, that even very mild-mannered and matter-of-fact men who go out shooting are apt to carry an excess of arms and accoutrements in order to impress upon their own imagination the seriousness of their undertaking. These huntsmen are also prone to a histrionic prancing gait and to an elaborate exaggeration of the motions, whether of stealth or of onslaught, involved in their deeds of exploit. Similarly, in athletic sports, there is almost invariably present a good share of rant and swagger and ostensible mystification, features which mark the histrionic nature of these employments. In all this, of course, the reminder of boyish make-believe is plain enough. The slang of athletics, by the way, is in great part made up of extremely sanguinary locutions borrowed from the terminology of warfare. Except where it is adopted as a necessary means of secret communication, the use of a special slang in any employment is probably to be accepted as evidence that the occupation in question is substantially make-believe. A further feature in which sports differ from the duel and similar disturbances of the peace is the peculiarity that they admit of other motives being assigned for them besides the impulses of exploit and ferocity. There is probably little, if any other motive present in any given case, but the fact that other reasons for indulging in sports are frequently assigned goes to say that other grounds are sometimes present in a subsidiary way. Sportsmen, hunters and anglers, are more or less in the habit of assigning a love of nature, the need of recreation and the like, 
as the incentives to their favorite pastime. These motives are no doubt frequently present and make up a part of the attractiveness of the sportsman's life, but these cannot be the chief incentives. These ostensible needs could be more readily and fully satisfied without the accompaniment of a systematic effort to take the life of those creatures that make up an essential feature of that nature that is beloved by the sportsman. It is indeed the most noticeable effect of the sportsman's activity to keep nature in a state of chronic desolation by killing off all living thing whose destruction he can compass. Still, there is ground for the sportsman's claim that under the existing conventionalities, his need of recreation and of contact with nature can best be satisfied by the course which he takes. Certain canons of good breeding have been imposed by the prescriptive example of a predatory leisure class in the past and have been somewhat painstakingly conserved by the usage of the latter-day representatives of that class and these canons will not permit him, without blame, to seek contact with nature on other terms. From being an honorable employment handed down from the predatory culture as the highest form of everyday leisure, sports have come to be the only form of outdoor activity that has the full sanction of decorum. Among the proximate incentives to shooting and angling, then, may be the need of recreation and outdoor life. The remoter cause which imposes the necessity of seeking these objects under the cover of systematic slaughter is a prescription that cannot be violated except at the risk of disrepute and consequent lesion to one's self-respect. The case of other kinds of sport is somewhat similar. Of this, athletic games are the best example. Prescriptive usage with respect to what forms of activity, exercise, and recreation are permissible under the code of reputable living is of course present here also. Those who are addicted to athletic sports or who admire them set up the claim that these afford the best available means of recreation and of physical culture, and prescriptive usage gives countenance to the claim. The canons of reputable living exclude from the scheme of life of the leisure class all activity that cannot be classed as conspicuous leisure, and consequently they tend by prescription to exclude it also from the scheme of life of the community generally. At the same time, purposeless physical exertion is tedious and distasteful beyond tolerance. As has been noticed in another connection, recourse is in such a case had to some form of activity which shall at least afford a colorable pretense of purpose even if the object assigned be only a make-believe sports satisfy these requirements of substantial futility together with the colorable make-believe of purpose in addition to this they afford scope for emulation and are attractive also on that account in order to be decorous an employment must conform to the leisure class canon of reputable waste. At the same time, all activity, in order to be persisted in as an habitual, even if only partial, expression of life, must conform to the generically human canon of efficiency for some serviceable objective end. The leisure class canon demands strict and comprehensive futility. The instinct of workmanship demands purposeful action. The leisure class canon of decorum acts slowly and pervasively by a selective elimination of all substantially useful or purposeful modes of action from the accredited scheme of life. The instinct of workmanship acts impulsively and may be satisfied provisionally with the proximate purpose. It is only as the apprehended ulterior futility of a given line of action enters the reflective complex of consciousness as an element essentially alien to the normally purposeful trend of the life process that its disquieting and deterrent effect on the consciousness of the agent is wrought. The individual's habits of thought make an organic complex, the trend of which is necessarily in the direction of serviceability to the life process. When it is attempted to assimilate systematic waste of utility as an end in life into this organic complex, there presently supervenes a revulsion. 
but this revulsion of the organism may be avoided if the attention can be confined to the proximate unreflected purpose of dexterous or emulative exertion sports hunting angling athletic games and the like afford an exercise for dexterity and for the emulative ferocity and astuteness characteristic of predatory life so long as the individual is but slightly gifted with reflection or with a sense of the ulterior trend of his actions so long as his life is substantially a life of naive impulsive action so long the immediate and unreflected purposefulness of sports in the way of an expression of dominance will measurably satisfy his instinct of workmanship this is especially true if his dominant impulses are the unreflecting emulative propensities of the predaceous temperament at the same time the canons of decorum will commend sports to him as expressions of a pecuniarily blameless life it is by meeting these two requirements of ulterior wastefulness and proximate purposefulness that any given employment holds its place as a traditional and habitual mode of decorous recreation in the sense that other forms of recreation and exercise are morally impossible to persons of good breeding and delicate sensibilities then sports are the best available means of recreation under existing circumstances but those members of respectable society who advocate athletic games commonly justify their attitude on this head to themselves and to their neighbors on the ground that these games serve as an invaluable means of development they not only improve the contestant's physique but it is commonly added that they also foster a manly spirit both in the participants and in the spectators football is the particular game which will probably first occur to any one in this community when the question of the serviceability of athletic games is raised as this form of athletic contest is at present uppermost in the mind of those who plead for or against games as a means of physical or moral salvation this typical athletic sport may therefore serve to illustrate the bearing of athletics upon the development of the contestant's character and physique it has been said not inaptly that the relation of football to physical culture is much the same as that of the bullfight to agriculture serviceability for these lusory institutions requires sedulous training or breeding the material used whether brute or human is subjected to careful selection and discipline in order to secure and accentuate certain aptitudes and propensities which are characteristic of the ferine state and which tend to obsolescence under domestication this does not mean that the result in either case is an all-around and consistent rehabilitation of the ferine or barbarian habit of mind and body the result is rather a one-sided return to barbarism or to the feroe natura a rehabilitation and accentuation of those ferine traits which make for damage and desolation without a corresponding development of the traits which would serve the individual's self-preservation and fullness of life in a ferine environment the culture bestowed in football gives a product of exotic ferocity and cunning it is a rehabilitation of the early barbarian temperament together with the suppression of those details of temperament which as seen from the standpoint of the social and economic exigencies are the redeeming features of the savage character the physical vigor acquired in the training for athletic games so far as the training may be said to have this effect is of advantage both to the individual and to the collectivity in that other things being equal it conduces to economic serviceability the spiritual traits which go with athletic sports are likewise economically advantageous to the individual as contradistinguished from the interests of the collectivity this holds true in any community where these traits are present in some degree in the population modern competition is in large part a process of self-assertion on the basis of these traits of predatory human nature in the sophisticated form in which they enter into the modern peaceable emulation 
the possession of these traits in some measure is almost a necessary of life to the civilized man but while they are indispensable to the competitive individual they are not directly serviceable to the community so far as regards the serviceability of the individual for the purposes of the collective life emulative efficiency is of use only indirectly if at all ferocity and cunning are of no use to the community except in its hostile dealings with other communities and they are useful to the individual only because there is so large a proportion of the same traits actively present in the human environment to which he is exposed any individual who enters the competitive struggle without the due endowment of these traits is at a disadvantage somewhat as a hornless steer would find himself at a disadvantage in a drove of horned cattle the possession and the cultivation of the predatory traits of character may of course be desirable on other than economic grounds there is a prevalent aesthetic or ethical predilection for the barbarian aptitudes and the traits in question minister so effectively to this predilection that their serviceability in the aesthetic or ethical respect probably offsets any economic unserviceability which they may give but for the present purpose that is beside the point therefore nothing is said here as to the desirability or advisability of sports on the whole or as to their value on other than economic grounds in popular apprehensions there is much that is admirable in the type of manhood which the life of sport fosters there is self-reliance and good fellowship so termed in the somewhat loose colloquial use of the words from a different point of view the qualities currently so characterized might be described as truculence and clannishness the reason for the current approval and admiration of these manly qualities as well as for their being called manly is the same as the reason for their usefulness to the individual the members of the community and especially that class of the community which sets the pace in canons of taste are endowed with this range of propensities in sufficient measure to make their absence in others felt as a shortcoming and to make their possession in an exceptional degree appreciated as an attribute of superior merit the traits of predatory men are by no means obsolete in the common run of modern populations they are present and can be called out in bold relief at any time by any appeal to the sentiments in which they express themselves unless this appeal should clash with the specific activities that make up our habitual occupations and comprise the general range of our everyday interests the common run of the population of any industrial community is emancipated from this economically considered untoward propensities only in the sense that through partial and temporary disuse they have lapsed into the background of subconscious motives with varying degrees of potency in different individuals they remain available for the aggressive shaping of men's actions and sentiments whenever a stimulus of more than everyday intensity comes in to call them forth and they assert themselves forcibly in any case where no occupation alien to the predatory culture has usurped the individual's everyday range of interest and sentiment this is the case among the leisure class and among certain portions of the population which are ancillary to that class hence the facility with which any new accessions to the leisure class take to sports and hence the rapid growth of sports and of the sporting sentient in any industrial community where wealth has accumulated sufficiently to exempt a considerable part of the population from work a homely and familiar fact may serve to show that the predaceous impulse does not prevail in the same degree in all classes taken simply as a feature of modern life the habit of carrying a walking stick may seem at best a trivial detail but the usage has a significance for the point in question of the classes among whom the habit most prevails the classes with whom the walking stick is associated in popular apprehension are the men of the leisure class proper sporting men and the lower class delinquents to this might perhaps be added the men engaged in the pecuniary employments 
the same is not true of the common run of men engaged in industry and it may be noted by the way that women do not carry a stick except in case of infirmity for it has a use of a different kind the practice is of course in great measure a matter of polite usage but the basis of polite usage is in turn the proclivities of the class which sets the pace in polite usage the walking stick serves the purpose of an advertisement that the bearer's hands are employed otherwise than in useful effort and it therefore has utility as an evidence of leisure but it is also a weapon and it meets a felt need of barbarian man on that ground the handling of so tangible and primitive a means of offence is very comforting to any one who is gifted with even a moderate share of ferocity the exigencies of the language make it impossible to avoid an apparent implication of disapproval of the attitudes propensities and expressions of life here under discussion it is however not intended to imply anything in the way of deprecation or commendation of any of these phases of human character or of the life process the various elements of the prevalent human nature are taken up from the point of view of economic theory and the traits discussed are gauged and graded with regard to their immediate economic bearing on the facility of the collective life process that is to say these phenomena are here apprehended from the economic point of view and are valued with respect to their direct action in furtherance or hindrance of a more perfect adjustment of the human collectivity to the environment and to the institutional structure required by the economic situation of the collectivity for the present and for the immediate future for these purposes the traits handed down from the predatory culture are less serviceable than might be although even in this connection it is not to be overlooked that the energetic aggressiveness and pertinacity of predatory man is a heritage of no mean value the economic value with some regard also to the social value in the narrower sense of these aptitudes and propensities is attempted to be passed upon without reflecting on their value as seen from another point of view when contrasted with the prosy mediocrity of the latter-day industrial scheme of life and judged by the accredited standards of morality and more especially by the standards of aesthetics and of poetry these survivals from a more primitive type of manhood may have a very different value from that here assigned to them but all this being foreign to the purpose in hand no expression of opinion on this latter head would be in place here all that is admissible is to enter the caution that these standards of excellence which are alien to the present purpose must not be allowed to influence our economic appreciation of these traits of human character or of the activities which foster their growth this applies both as regards those persons who actively participate in sports and those whose sporting experience consists in contemplation only what is here said of the sporting propensity is likewise pertinent to sundry reflections presently to be made in this connection on what would colloquially be known as the religious life end of second part of chapter ten recording by shenna sir fresno california section twenty five of the theory of the leisure class this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit l i b r i v o x dot o r g recording by rachel resnick the theory of the leisure class by thorsten veblen third part of chapter ten modern survivals of prowess the last paragraph incidentally touches upon the fact that everyday speech can scarcely be employed in discussing this class of aptitudes and activities without implying deprecation or apology the fact is significant as showing the habitual attitude of the dispassionate common man toward the propensities which express themselves in sports and in exploit generally and this is perhaps as convenient a place as any to discuss that undertone of deprecation which runs through all the voluminous discourse in defense or in laudation of athletic sports 
as well as of other activities of a predominantly predatory character. The same apologetic frame of mind is at least beginning to be observable in the spokesmen of most other institutions handed down from the barbarian phase of life. Among these archaic institutions which are felt to need apology are comprised with others the entire existing system of the distribution of wealth together with the resulting class distinction of status. All or nearly all forms of consumption that come under the head of conspicuous waste, the status of women under the patriarchal system, and many features of the traditional creeds and devout observances, especially the exoteric expressions of the creed and the naive apprehension of received observances. What is to be said in this connection of the apologetic attitude taken in commending sports and the sporting character will therefore apply, with a suitable change in phraseology, to the apologies offered in behalf of these other related elements of our social heritage. There is a feeling, usually vague and not commonly avowed in so many words by the apologist himself, but ordinarily perceptible in the manner of his discourse, that these sports, as well as the general range of predaceous impulses and habits of thought which underlie the sporting character, do not altogether commend themselves to common sense. As to the majority of murderers, they are very incorrect characters. This aphorism offers a valuation of the predaceous temperament and of the disciplinary effects of its overt expression and exercise as seen from the moralist's point of view. As such, it affords an indication of what is the deliverance of the sober sense of mature men as to the degree of availability of the predatory habit of mind for the purposes of the collective life. It is felt that the presumption is against any activity which involves habituation to the predatory attitude, and that the burden of proof lies with those who speak for the rehabilitation of the predaceous temper and for the practices which strengthen it. There is a strong body of popular sentiment in favor of diversions and enterprises of the kind in question, but there is at the same time present in the community a pervading sense that this ground of sentiment wants legitimation. The required legitimation is ordinarily sought by showing that although sports are substantially of a predatory, socially disintegrating effect, Although their proximate effect runs in the direction of reversion to propensities that are industrially disserviceable, yet indirectly and remotely, by some not readily comprehensible process of polar induction, or counter-irritation perhaps, sports are conceived to foster a habit of mind that is serviceable for the social or industrial purpose. That is to say, although sports are essentially of the nature of invidious exploit, it is presumed that by some remote and obscure effect they result in the growth of a temperament conducive to non-invidious work. It is commonly attempted to show all this empirically, or it is rather assumed that this is the empirical generalization which must be obvious to anyone who cares to see it. In conducting the proof of this thesis, the treacherous ground of inference from cause to effect is somewhat shrewdly avoided except so far as to show that the, quote, manly virtues, unquote, spoken of above, are fostered by sports. But since it is these manly virtues that are economically in need of legitimation, the chain of proof breaks off where it should begin. In the most general economic terms, these apologies are an effort to show that, in spite of the logic of the thing, sports do in fact further what may be broadly called workmanship. So long as he has not succeeded in persuading himself or others that this is their effect, the thoughtful apologist for sports will not rest content, and commonly it is to be admitted he does not rest content. His discontent with his own vindication of the practice in question is ordinarily shown by his truculent tone and by the eagerness with which he heaps up asservations in support of his position. But why are apologies needed? If there prevails a body of popular sentient in favor of sports, why is not that fact a sufficient legitimation? 
the protracted discipline of prowess to which the race has been subjected under the predatory and quasi-peaceable culture has transmitted to the men of today a temperament that finds gratification in these expressions of ferocity and cunning. So why not accept these sports as legitimate expressions of a normal and wholesome human nature? What other norm is there that is to be lived up to than that given in the aggregate range of propensities that express themselves in the sentiments of this generation, including the hereditary strain of prowess? The ulterior norm to which appeal is taken is the instinct of workmanship, which is an instinct more fundamental, of more ancient prescription, than the propensity to predatory emulation. The latter is but a special development of the instinct of workmanship, a variant relatively late and ephemeral in spite of its great absolute antiquity. The emulative predatory impulse, or the instinct of sportsmanship as it might well be called, is essentially unstable in comparison with the primordial instinct of workmanship out of which it has been developed and differentiated. Tested by this ulterior norm of life, predatory emulation, and therefore the life of sports falls short. The manner and the measure in which the institution of a leisure class conduces to the conservation of sports and invidious exploit can, of course, not be succinctly stated. From the evidence already recited, it appears that, in sentient and inclinations, the leisure class is more favorable to a warlike attitude and animus than the industrial classes. Something similar seems to be true as regards sports. But it is chiefly in its indirect effects, though the canons of decorous living, that the institution has its influence on the prevalent sentiment with respect to the sporting life. This indirect effect goes almost unequivocally in the direction of furthering a survival of the predatory temperament and habits. And this is true even with respect to those variants of the sporting life which the higher leisure class code of proprieties proscribes, as, e.g., prize fighting, cock fighting, and other like vulgar expressions of the sporting temper. Whatever the latest authenticated schedule of detailed proprieties may say, the accredited canons of decency sanctioned by the institution say without equivocation that emulation and waste are good and their opposites are disreputable. In the crepuscular light of the social nether spaces, the details of the code are not apprehended with all the facility that might be desired, and these broad underlying canons of decency are therefore applied somewhat unreflectingly with little question as to the scope of their competence or the exceptions that have been sanctioned in detail. Addiction to athletic sports not only in the way of direct participation, but also in the way of sentiment and moral support, is, in a more or less pronounced degree, a characteristic of the leisure class, and it is a trait which that class shares with the lower class delinquents, and with such atavistic elements throughout the body of the community as are endowed with a dominant predaceous trend. Few individuals among the populations of Western civilized countries are so far devoid of the predaceous instinct as to find no diversion in contemplating athletic sports and games, but with the common run of individuals among the industrial classes, the inclination to sports does not assert itself to the extent of constituting what may fairly be called a sporting habit. With these classes, sports are an occasional diversion rather than a serious feature of life. This common body of the people can therefore not be said to cultivate the sporting propensity. Although it is not obsolete in the average of them, or even in any appreciable number of individuals, yet the predilection for sports in the commonplace industrial classes is of the nature of a reminiscence, more or less diverting as an occasional interest, rather than a vital and permanent interest that counts as a dominant factor in shaping the organic complex of habits of thought into which it enters. As it manifests itself in the sporting life of today, this propensity may not appear to be an economic factor of grave consequence. Taken simply by itself, 
it does not count for a great deal in its direct effects on the industrial efficiency or the consumption of any given individual but the prevalence and the growth of the type of human nature of which this propensity is a characteristic feature is a matter of some consequence it affects the economic life of the collectivity both as regards the rate of economic development and as regards the character of the results attained by the development for better or worse the fact that the popular habits of thought are in any degree dominated by this type of character cannot but greatly affect the scope direction standards and ideals of the collective economic life as well as the degree of adjustment of the collective life to the environment something to a like effect is to be said of other traits that go to make up the barbarian character for the purposes of economic theory these further barbarian traits may be taken as concomitant variations of that predaceous temper of which prowess is an expression in great measure they are not primarily of an economic character nor do they have much direct economic bearing they serve to indicate the stage of economic evolution to which the individual possessed of them is adapted they are of importance therefore as extraneous tests of the degree of adaptation of the character in which they are comprised to the economic exigencies of today but they are also to some extent important as being aptitudes which themselves go to increase or diminish the economic serviceability of the individual as it finds expression in the life of the barbarian prowess manifests itself in two main directions force and fraud in varying degrees these two forms of expression are similarly present in modern warfare in the pecuniary occupations and in sports and games both lines of aptitudes are cultivated and strengthened by the life of sport as well as by the more serious forms of emulative life strategy or cunning is an element invariably present in games as also in warlike pursuits and in the chase in all of these employments strategy tends to develop into finesse and chicanery chicanery falsehood browbeating hold a well-secured place in the method of procedure of any athletic contest and in games generally the habitual employment of an umpire and the minute technical regulations governing the limits and details of permissible fraud and strategic advantage sufficiently attest the fact that fraudulent practices and attempts to overreach one's opponents are not adventitious features of the game in the nature of the case habituation to sport should conduce to a fuller development of the aptitude for fraud and the prevalence in the community of that predatory temperament which inclines men to sports connotes a prevalence of sharp practice and callous disregard of the interests of others individually and collectively resort to fraud in any guise and under any legitimation of law or custom is an expression of a narrowly self-regarding habit of mind it is needless to dwell at any length on the economic value of this feature of the sporting character in this connection it is to be noted that the most obvious characteristic of the physiognomy affected by athletic and other sporting men is that of an extreme astuteness the gifts and exploits of ulysses are scarcely second to those of achilles either in their substantial furtherance of the game or in the eclat which they give the astute sporting man among his associates the pantomime of astuteness is commonly the first step in that assimilation to the professional sporting man which a youth undergoes after matriculation in any reputable school of the secondary or higher education as the case may be and the physiognomy of astuteness as a decorative feature never ceases to receive the thoughtful attention of men whose serious interest lies in athletic games races or other contests of a similar emulative nature as a further indication of their spiritual kinship it may be pointed out that the members of the lower delinquent class usually show this physiognomy of astuteness in a marked degree and that they very commonly show the same histrionic exaggeration of it that is often seen in the young candidate for athletic honors this by the way is the most legible mark of what is vulgarly called toughness in youthful aspirants for a bad name 
The astute man, it may be remarked, is of no economic value to the community unless it be for the purpose of sharp practice in dealings with other communities. His functioning is not a furtherance of the generic life process. At its best, in its direct economic bearing, it is a conversion of the economic substance of the collectivity to a growth alien to the collective life process, very much after the analogy of what in medicine would be called a benign tumor, with some tendency to transgress the uncertain line that divides the benign from the malign growths. The two barbarian traits, ferocity and astuteness, go to make up the predacious temper or spiritual attitude. They are the expressions of a narrowly self-regarding habit of mind. Both are highly serviceable for individual expediency in a life looking to invidious success. Both also have a high aesthetic value. Both are fostered by the pecuniary culture. But both alike are of no use for the purposes of the collective life. End of chapter 10 Recording by Rachel Resnick Horsham, P.A. R-A-C-H-E-L-R-E-S-N-I-C-K dot voices dot com Section 26 of End of the First Part of Chapter 11 End of the First Part of Chapter 11 Please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Anna Simon the Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen Chapter 11 The Belief in Luck The gambling propensity is another subsidiary trait of the barbarian temperament. It is a concomitant variation of character of almost universal prevalence among sporting men and among men given to warlike and emulative activities generally. This trait also has a direct economic value. It is recognized to be a hindrance to the highest industrial efficiency of the aggregate in any community where it prevails in an appreciable degree. The gambling proclivity is doubtfully to be classed as a feature belonging exclusively to the predatory type of human nature. The chief factor in the gambling habit is the belief in luck, and this belief is apparently traceable, at least in its elements, to a stage in human evolution antedating the predatory culture. It may well have been under the predatory culture that the belief in luck was developed into the form in which it is present as the chief element of the gambling proclivity in the sporting temperament. It probably owes the specific form under which it occurs in the modern culture to the predatory discipline. But the belief in luck is in substance a habit of more ancient date than the predatory culture. It is one form of the artistic apprehension of things. The belief seems to be a trade carried over in substance from an earlier phase into the barbarian culture, and transmuted and transmitted through that culture to a later stage of human development, under a specific form imposed by the predatory discipline. But, in any case, it is to be taken as an archaic trade, inherited from a more or less remote past, more or less incompatible with the requirements of the modern industrial process, and more or less of a hindrance to the fullest efficiency of the collective economic life of the present. While the belief in luck is the basis of the gambling habit, it is not the only element that enters into the habit of betting. Betting on the issue of contests of strength and skill proceeds on a further motive, without which the belief in luck would scarcely come in as a prominent feature of sporting life. This further motive is the desire of the anticipated winner or the partisan of the anticipated winning side, to heighten his side's ascendancy at the cost of the loser. Not only does the stronger side score a more signal victory, and the losing side suffer a more painful and humiliating defeat, in proportion as the pecuniary gain and loss in the wager is large, although this alone is a consideration of material weight. But the wager is commonly laid also with a view, not avowed in words, nor even recognized in set terms in petto, to enhancing the chances of success for the contestant on which it is laid. It is felt that substance and solicitude expended to this end cannot go for naught in the issue. There is here a special manifestation of the instinct of workmanship, backed by an even more manifest sense that the animistic congruity of things must decide for a victorious outcome 
for the side in whose behalf the propensity inherent in events has been propitiated and fortified by so much of a cognitive and kinetic urging. This incentive to the wager expresses itself freely under the form of backing one's favourite in any contest, and it is unmistakably a predatory feature. It is as ancillary to the predaceous impulse proper that the belief in luck expresses itself in a wager. So that it may be set down that, in so far as the belief in luck comes to expression in the form of laying a wager, it is to be accounted an integral element of the predatory type of character. The belief is, in its elements, an archaic habit, which belongs substantially to early, undifferentiated human nature. But when this belief is helped out by the predatory emulative impulse, and so is differentiated into the specific form of the gambling habit, it is, in this higher developed and specific form, to be classed as a trait of the barbarian character. The belief in luck is a sense of fortuitous necessity in the sequence of phenomena. In its various mutations and expressions, it is of very serious importance for the economic efficiency of any community in which it prevails to an appreciable extent. So much so as to warrant a more detailed discussion of its origin and content and of the bearing of its various ramifications upon economic structure and function, as well as a discussion of the relation of the leisure class to its growth, differentiation, and persistence. In the developed, integrated form in which it is most readily observed in the barbarian of the predatory culture, or in the sporting man of modern communities, the belief comprises at least two distinguishable elements, which are to be taken as two different phases of the same fundamental habit of thought, or as the same psychological factor in two successive phases of its evolution. The fact that these two elements are successive phases of the same general line of growth of belief does not hinder their coexisting in the habits of thought of any given individual. The more primitive form, or the more archaic phase, is an incipient animistic belief, or an animistic sense of relations and things, that imputes a quasi-personal character to facts. To the archaic man, all the obtrusive and obviously consequential objects and facts in his environment have a quasi-personal individuality. They are conceived to be possessed of volition, or rather of propensities which enter into the complex of causes and affect events in an inscrutable manner. The sporting man's sense of luck and chance, or of fortuitous necessity, is an inarticulate or inchoate animism. It applies to objects and situations, often in a very vague way but it is usually so far defined as to imply the possibility of propitiating, or of deceiving and cajoling, or otherwise disturbing the holding of propensities resident in the objects which constitute the apparatus and accessories of any game of skill or chance. There are few sporting men who are not in the habit of wearing charms or talismans, to which more or less of efficacy is felt to belong and the proportion is not much less of those who instinctively dread the hoodooing of the contestants, or the apparatus engaged in any contest on which they lay a wager, or who feel that the fact of their backing a given contestant or side in the game does and ought to strengthen that side, or to whom the mascot which they cultivate means something more than a jest. In its simple form, the belief in luck is this instinctive sense of an inscrutable teleological propensity in objects or situations. Objects or events have a propensity to eventuate in a given end, whether this end or objective point of the sequence is conceived to be fortuitously given or deliberately sought. From this simple animism the belief shades off by insensible gradations into the second derivative form or phase above referred to which is a more or less articulate belief in an inscrutable preternatural agency. The preternatural agency works through the visible objects with which it is associated, but is not identified with these objects in point of individuality. The use of the term preternatural agency here carries no further implication as to the nature of the agency spoken of as preternatural. This is only a farther development of animistic belief. The preternatural agency is not necessarily conceived to be a personal agent in the full sense, but it is an agency which partakes of the attributes of personality to the extent of somewhat arbitrarily influencing the outcome of any enterprise, and especially of any contest. The pervading belief in the Hamingia or Gipta, Gaifa, 
Autna, which lends so much of colour to the Icelandic sagas specifically, and to early Germanic folk legends, is an illustration of this sense of an extra-physical propensity in the course of events. In this expression or form of the belief, the propensity is scarcely personified, although to a varying extent an individuality is imputed to it, and this individuated propensity is sometimes conceived to yield to circumstances, commonly to circumstances of a spiritual or preternatural character. A well-known and striking exemplification of the belief, in a fairly advanced stage of differentiation and involving an anthropomorphic personification of the preternatural agent appealed to, is afforded by the wager of battle. Here the preternatural agent was conceived to act on request as umpire, and to shape the outcome of the contest in accordance with some stipulated ground of decision, such as the equity or legality of the respective contestants' claims. The like sense of an inscrutable but spiritually necessary tendency in events is still traceable as an obscure element in current popular belief, as shown, for instance, by the well-accredited maxim, Thrice is he armed who knows his quarrel just a maxim which retains much of its significance for the average unreflecting person even in the civilized communities of today. The modern reminiscence of the belief in the Hamingia or in the guidance of an unseen hand, which is traceable in the acceptance of this maxim, is faint and perhaps uncertain, and it seems in any case to be blended with other psychological moments that are not clearly of an animistic character. For the purpose in hand, it is unnecessary to look more closely into the psychological process or the ethnological line of descent by which the later of these two animistic apprehensions of propensity is derived from the earlier. This question may be of the gravest importance to folk psychology or to the theory of the evolution of creeds and cults. The same is true of the more fundamental question whether the two are related at all as successive phases in a sequence of development. Reference is here made to the existence of these questions only to remark that the interest of the present discussion does not lie in that direction. So far as concerns economic theory, these two elements or phases of the belief in luck or in an extra-causal trend or propensity in things are of substantially the same character. They have an economic significance as habits of thought which affect the individual's habitual view of the facts and sequences with which he comes in contact and which thereby affect the individual's serviceability for the industrial purpose. Therefore, apart from all question of the beauty, worth, or beneficence of any animistic belief, there is place for a discussion of their economic bearing on the serviceability of the individual as an economic factor, and especially as an industrial agent. It has already been noted in an earlier connection that in order to have the highest serviceability in the complex industrial processes of today, the individual must be endowed with the aptitude and the habit of readily apprehending and relating facts in terms of causal sequence. Both as a whole and in its details, the industrial process is a process of quantitative causation. The intelligence demanded of the workman, as well as of the director of an industrial process, is little else than a degree of facility in the apprehension of and adaptation to a quantitatively determined causal sequence. This facility of apprehension and adaptation is what is lacking in stupid workmen, and the growth of this facility is the end sought in their education, so far as their education aims to enhance their industrial efficiency. In so far as the individual's inherited aptitudes or his training incline him to account for facts and sequences in other terms than those of causation or matter of fact, they lower his productive efficiency or industrial usefulness. This lowering of efficiency through a penchant for animistic methods of apprehending facts is especially apparent when taken in the mass, when a given population with an animistic turn is viewed as a whole. The economic drawbacks of animism are more patent and its consequences are more far-reaching under the modern system of large industry than under any other. In the modern industrial communities, industry is, to a constantly increasing extent, being organized in a comprehensive system of organs and functions mutually conditioning one another, and therefore freedom from all bias in the causal apprehension of phenomena grows constantly more requisite to efficiency on the part of the man concerned in industry. Under a system of handicraft, an advantage in dexterity, diligence, muscular force or endurance 
may, in a very large measure, offset such a bias in the habits of thought of the workman. Similarly, in agricultural industry of the traditional kind, which closely resembles handicraft in the nature of the demands made upon the workman. In both, the workman is himself the prime mover chiefly depended upon, and the natural forces engaged are in large part apprehended as inscrutable and fortuitous agencies, whose working lies beyond the workman's control or discretion. In popular apprehension, there is in these forms of industry relatively little of the industrial process left to the fateful swing of a comprehensive mechanical sequence which must be comprehended in terms of causation, and to which the operations of industry and the movements of the workmen must be adapted. As industrial methods develop, the virtues of the handicraftsman count for less and less as an offset to scanty intelligence, or a halting acceptance of the sequence of cause and effect. The industrial organization assumes more and more of the character of a mechanism in which it is man's office to discriminate and select what natural forces shall work out their effects in his service. The workman's part in industry changes from that of a prime mover to that of discrimination and valuation of quantitative sequences and mechanical facts. The faculty of a ready apprehension and unbiased appreciation of causes in his environment grows in relative economic importance and any element in the complex of his habits of thought which intrudes a bias at variance with this ready appreciation of matter-of-fact sequence gains proportionally in importance as a disturbing element acting to lower his industrial usefulness. Through its cumulative effect upon the habitual attitude of the population, even a slight or inconspicuous bias towards accounting for everyday facts by recourse to other ground than that of quantitative causation, may work an appreciable lowering of the collective industrial efficiency of a community. End of the first part of chapter 11section 27 of the theory of the leisure class this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anna simon the theory of the leisure class by thorsten veblen second part of chapter 11 the belief in luck the animistic habit of mind may occur in the early undifferentiated form of an inchoate animistic belief or in the later and more highly integrated phase in which there is an anthropomorphic personification of the propensity imputed to facts. The industrial value of such a lively animistic sense, or of such recourse to a preternatural agency, or the guidance of an unseen hand, is of course very much the same in either case. As affects the industrial serviceability of the individual, the effect is of the same kind in either case but the extent to which this habit of thought dominates or shapes the complex of his habits of thought varies with the degree of immediacy, urgency, or exclusiveness with which the individual habitually applies the animistic or anthropomorphic formula in dealing with the facts of his environment. The animistic habit acts in all cases to blur the appreciation of causal sequence, but the earlier, less reflected, less defined animistic sense of propensity may be expected to affect the intellectual processes of the individual in a more pervasive way than the higher forms of anthropomorphism. Where the animistic habit is present in the naive form, its scope and range of application are not defined or limited. It will therefore palpably affect his thinking at every turn of the person's life, wherever he has to do with the material means of life. In the later, mature development of animism, after it has been defined through the process of anthropomorphic elaboration, when its application has been limited in a somewhat consistent fashion to the remote and the invisible, it comes about that an increasing range of everyday facts are provisionally accounted for without recourse to the preternatural agency in which a cultivated animism expresses itself. A highly integrated, personified, preternatural agency is not a convenient means of handling the trivial occurrences of life, and a habit is therefore easily fallen into of accounting for many trivial or vulgar phenomena in terms of sequence. The provisional explanation so arrived at is by neglect allowed to stand as definitive, for trivial purposes, until special provocation or perplexity, 
recalls the individual to his allegiance. But when special exigencies arise, that is to say, when there is peculiar need of a full and free recourse to the law of cause and effect, then the individual commonly has recourse to the preternatural agency as a universal solvent, if he is possessed of an anthropomorphic belief. The extra-causal propensity or agent has a very high utility as a recourse in perplexity, but its utility is altogether of a non-economic kind. It is especially a refuge and a fund of comfort where it has attained the degree of consistency and specialization that belongs to an anthropomorphic divinity. It has much to commend it, even on other grounds than that of affording the perplexed individual a means of escape from the difficulty of accounting for phenomena in terms of causal sequence. It would scarcely be in place here to dwell on the obvious and well-accepted merits of an anthropomorphic divinity, as seen from the point of view of the aesthetic, moral, or spiritual interest, or even as seen from the less remote standpoint of political, military, or social policy. The question here concerns the less picturesque and less urgent economic value of the belief in such a preternatural agency, taken as a habit of thought which affects the industrial serviceability of the believer. And even within this narrow economic range, the inquiry is perforce confined to the immediate bearing of this habit of thought upon the believer's workmanlike serviceability, rather than extended to include its remoter economic effects. These remoter effects are very difficult to trace. The inquiry into them is so encumbered with current preconceptions as to the degree in which life is enhanced by spiritual contact with such a divinity, that any attempt to inquire into their economic value must for the present be fruitless. The immediate, direct effect of the animistic habit of thought upon the general frame of mind of the believer goes in the direction of lowering his effective intelligence in the respect in which intelligence is of a special consequence for modern industry. The effect follows, in varying degree, whether the preternatural agent or propensity believed in is of a higher or a lower caste. This holds true of the barbarian's and the sporting man's sense of luck and propensity, and likewise of the somewhat higher developed belief in an anthropomorphic divinity such as is commonly possessed by the same class. It must be taken to hold true also, though with what relative degree of cogency is not easy to say, of the more adequately developed anthropomorphic cults, such as appeal to the devout, civilized man. The industrial disability entailed by a popular adherence to one of the higher anthropomorphic cults may be relatively slight, but it is not to be overlooked and even these high-class cults of the Western culture do not represent the last dissolving face of this human sense of extra-causal propensity. Beyond these, the same animistic sense shows itself also in such attenuations of anthropomorphisms as the eighteenth century appealed to an order of nature and natural rights, and in their modern representative, the ostensibly post-Darwinian concept of a meliorative trend in the process of evolution. This animistic explanation of phenomena is a form of the fallacy which the logicians knew by the name of ignava ratio. For the purposes of industry or of science, it counts as a blunder in the apprehension and valuation of facts. Apart from its direct industrial consequences, the animistic habit has a certain significance for economic theory on other grounds. 1. It is a fairly reliable indication of the presence, and to some extent even of the degree of potency, of certain other archaic traits that accompany it and that are of substantial economic consequence. And 2. The material consequences of that code of devout proprieties to which the animistic habit gives rise in the development of an anthropomorphic cult are of importance both a as affecting the community's consumption of goods and the prevalent canons of taste as already suggested in an earlier chapter and b by inducing and conserving a certain habitual recognition of the relation to a superior and so stiffening the current sense of status and allegiance as regards the point last named b that body of habits of thought which makes up the character of any individual is in some sense an organic whole. 
a marked variation in a given direction at any one point carries with it, as its correlative, a concomitant variation in the habitual expression of life in other directions or other groups of activities. These various habits of thought or habitual expressions of life are all phases of the single life sequence of the individual. Therefore, a habit formed in response to a given stimulus will necessarily affect the character of the response made to other stimuli. A modification of human nature at any one point is a modification of human nature as a whole. On this ground, and perhaps to a still greater extent on obscurer grounds that cannot be discussed here, there are these concomitant variations as between the different traits of human nature. So, for instance, barbarian peoples with a well-developed predatory scheme of life are commonly also possessed of a strong prevailing animistic habit, a well-formed anthropomorphic cult, and a lively sense of status. On the other hand, anthropomorphism and the realizing sense of an animistic propensity and material are less obtrusively present in the life of the peoples at the cultural stages which precede and which follow the barbarian culture. The sense of status is also feebler, on the whole, in peaceable communities. It is to be remarked that a lively but slightly specialized animistic belief is to be found in most, if not all, peoples living in the anti-predatory, savage stage of culture. The primitive savage takes his animism less seriously than the barbarian or the degenerate savage. With him, it eventuates in fantastic myth-making rather than in coercive superstition. The barbarian culture shows sportsmanship, status, and anthropomorphism. There is commonly observable a like concomitance of variations in the same respect in the individual temperament of men in the civilized communities of today. Those modern representatives of the predaceous barbarian temper that make up the sporting element are commonly believers in luck. At least they have a strong sense of an animistic propensity in things, by force of which they are given to gambling. So also as regards anthropomorphism in this class. Such of them as give in their adhesion to some creed commonly attach themselves to one of the naively and consistently anthropomorphic creeds. There are relatively few sporting men who seek spiritual comfort in the less anthropomorphic cults, such as the Unitarian or the Universalist. Closely bound up with this correlation of anthropomorphism and prowess is the fact that anthropomorphic cults act to conserve, if not to initiate, habits of mind favourable to a regime of status. As regards this point, it is quite impossible to say where the disciplinary effect of the cult ends and where the evidence of a concomitance of variations in inherited traits begins. In their finest development, the predatory temperament, the sense of status, and the anthropomorphic cult altogether belong to the barbarian culture and something of a mutual causal relation subsists between the three phenomena as they come into sight in communities on that cultural level. The way in which they recur in correlation in the habits and attitudes of individuals and classes today goes far to imply a like causal or organic relation between the same psychological phenomena considered as traits or habits of the individual. It has appeared at an earlier point in the discussion that the relation of status as a feature of social structure is a consequence of the predatory habit of life. As regards its line of derivation, it is substantially an elaborated expression of the predatory attitude. On the other hand, an anthropomorphic cult is a code of detailed relations of status superimposed upon the concept of a preternatural, inscrutable propensity in material things so that, as regards the external facts of his derivation, the cult may be taken as an outgrowth of archaic man's pervading animistic sense, defined and in some degree transformed by the predatory habit of life, the result being a personified preternatural agency, which is by imputation endowed with a full complement of the habits of thought that characterize the man of the predatory culture. The grosser psychological features in the case, which have an immediate bearing on economic theory and are consequently to be taken account of here, are therefore a. As has appeared in an earlier chapter, the predatory, emulative habit of mind, here called prowess, is but the barbarian variant of the generically human instinct of workmanship, which has fallen into this specific form under the guidance of a habit of invidious comparison of persons. 
b the relation of status is a formal expression of such an invidious comparison duly gauged and graded according to a sanctioned schedule c an anthropomorphic cult in the days of its early vigour at least is an institution the characteristic element of which is a relation of status between the human subject as inferior and the personified preternatural agency as superior with this in mind there should be no difficulty in recognizing the intimate relation which subsists between these three phenomena of human nature and of human life the relation amounts to an identity in some of their substantial elements on the one hand the system of status and the predatory habit of life are an expression of the instinct of workmanship as it takes form under a custom of invidious comparison on the other hand the anthropomorphic cult and the habit of devout observances are an expression of man's animistic sense of a propensity in material things elaborated under the guidance of substantially the same general habit of invidious comparison the two categories the emulative habit of life and the habit of devout observances are therefore to be taken as complementary elements of the barbarian type of human nature and of its modern barbarian variants they are expressions of much the same range of aptitudes made in response to different sets of stimuli. End of chapter 11 Section 28 of The Theory of the Leisure Class This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Westra. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. Chapter 12. Devout Observances. A discursive rehearsal of certain incidents of modern life will show the organic relation of the anthropomorphic cults to the barbarian culture and temperament. It will likewise serve to show how the survival and efficacy of the cults and the prevalence of their schedule of devout observances are related to the institution of a leisure class and to the springs of action underlying that institution without any intention to commend or to deprecate the practices to be spoken of under the head of devout observances or the spiritual and intellectual traits of which these observances are the expression the everyday phenomena of current anthropomorphic cults may be taken up from the point of view of the interest which they have for economic theory what can properly be spoken of here are the tangible external features of devout observances the moral as well as the devotional value of the life of faith lies outside of the scope of the present inquiry of course no question is here entertained as to the truth or beauty of the creeds on which the cults proceed and even their remoter economic bearing cannot be taken up here the subject is too recondite and of too grave import to find a place in so slight a sketch something has been said in an earlier chapter as to the influence which pecuniary standards of value exert upon the processes of valuation carried out on other bases not related to the pecuniary interest the relation is not altogether one-sided the economic standards or canons of valuation are in their turn influenced by extra economic standards of value our judgments of the economic bearing of facts are to some extent shaped by the dominant presence of these weightier interests there is a point of view indeed from which the economic interest is of weight only as being ancillary to these higher non-economic interests for the present purpose therefore some thought must be taken to isolate the economic interest or the economic hearing of these phenomena of anthropomorphic cults it takes some effort to divest oneself of the more serious point of view and to reach an economic appreciation of these facts with as little as may be of the bias due to higher interests extraneous to economic theory in the discussion of the sporting temperament it has appeared that the sense of an animistic propensity in material things and events is what affords the spiritual basis of the sporting man's gambling habit for the economic purpose this sense of propensity is substantially the same psychological element as expresses itself under a variety of forms in animistic beliefs and anthropomorphic creeds so far as concerns those tangible psychological features 
with which economic theory has to deal, the gambling spirit which pervades the sporting element shades off by insensible gradations into that frame of mind which finds gratification in devout observances. As seen from the point of view of economic theory, the sporting character shades off into the character of a religious devotee, where the betting man's animistic sense is helped out by a somewhat consistent tradition, it is developed into a more or less articulate belief in a preternatural or hyperphysical agency, with something of an anthropomorphic content. And where this is the case, there is commonly a perceptible inclination to make terms with the preternatural agency by some approved method of approach and conciliation. This element of propitiation and cajoling has much in common with the crasser forms of worship, if not in historical derivation, at least in actual psychological content. It obviously shades off in unbroken continuity into what is recognized as superstitious practice and belief, and so asserts its claim to kinship with the grosser anthropomorphic cults. The sporting or gambling temperament, then, comprises some of the substantial psychological elements that go to make a believer in creeds and an observer of devout forms, the chief point of coincidence being the belief in an inscrutable propensity or preternatural interposition in the sequence of events. For the purpose of the gambling practice, the belief in preternatural agency may be, and ordinarily is, less closely formulated, especially as regards the habits of thought and the scheme of life imputed to the preternatural agent, or in other words, as regards his moral character and his purposes in interfering in events. With respect to the individuality or personality of the agency whose presence as luck, or chance, or hoodoo, or mascot, etc., he feels and sometimes dreads and endeavors to evade, the sporting man's views are also less specific, less integrated and differentiated. The basis of his gambling activity is, in great measure, simply an instinctive sense of the presence of a pervasive, extra-physical and arbitrary force or propensity in things or situations, which is scarcely recognized as a personal agent. The betting man is not infrequently both a believer in luck, in this naive sense, and at the same time a pretty staunch adherent of some form of accepted creed. He is especially prone to accept so much of the creed as concerts the inscrutable power and the arbitrary habits of the divinity which has won his confidence. In such a case he is possessed of two, or sometimes more than two, distinguishable phases of animism. Indeed, the complete series of successive phases of animistic belief is to be found unbroken in the spiritual furniture of any sporting community. Conceptions will compromise the most elementary form of an instinctive sense of luck and chance and fortuitous necessity at one end of the series, together with the perfectly developed anthropomorphic divinity at the other end, with all intervening stages of integration. Coupled with these beliefs in preternatural agency goes an instinctive shaping of conduct to conform with the surmised requirements of the lucky chance on the one hand, and a more or less devout submission to the inscrutable decrees of the divinity on the other hand. There is a relationship in this respect between the sporting temperament and the temperament of the delinquent classes, and the two are related to the temperament which inclines to an anthropomorphic cult. Both the delinquent and the sporting man are, on the average, more apt to be adherents of some accredited creed, and are also rather more inclined to devout observances than the general average of the community. It is also noticeable that unbelieving members of these classes show more of a proclivity to become proselytes to some accredited faith than the average of unbelievers. This fact of observation is avowed by the spokesmen of sports, especially in apologizing for the more naively predatory athletic sports. Indeed, it is somewhat insistently claimed as a meritorious feature of sporting life that the habitual participants in athletic games are, in some degree, peculiarly given to devout practices. And it is observable that the cult to which sporting men and the predacious delinquent classes adhere, or to which proselytes from these classes commonly attach themselves, is ordinarily not one of the so-called higher faiths, but a cult which has to do with a thoroughly anthropomorphic divinity. Archaic, predatory human nature is not satisfied with abstruse conceptions of a dissolving personality that shades off into the concept of quantitative causal sequence, such as the speculative esoteric creeds of Christendom impute to the first cause, 
universal intelligence, world soul, or spiritual aspect, as an instance of a cult of the character which the habits of mind of the athlete and the delinquent require may be cited that branch of the church militant known as the Salvation Army. This is to some extent recruited from the lower class delinquents, and it appears to comprise also, among its officers especially, a larger portion of men with a sporting record than the proportion of such men in the aggregate population of the community. College athletics affords a case in point. It is contended by exponents of the devout element in college life, and there seems to be no ground for disputing the claim that the desirable athletic material afforded by any student body in this country is at the same time predominantly religious, or that it is at least given to devout observances to a greater degree than the average of those students whose interest in athletics and other college sports is less. This is what might be expected on theoretical grounds. It may be remarked, by the way, that from one point of view this is felt to reflect credit on the college sporting life, on athletic games, and on those persons who occupy themselves with these matters. It happens not frequently that college sporting men devote themselves to religious propaganda, either as a vocation or as a by-occupation and it is observable that when this happens they are likely to become propagandists of some one of the more anthropomorphic cults. In their teaching they are apt to insist chiefly on the personal relation of status which subsists between an anthropomorphic divinity and the human subject. This intimate relation between athletics and devout observance among college men is a fact of sufficient notoriety but it has a special feature to which attention has not been called, although it is obvious enough. The religious zeal which pervades much of the college sporting element is especially prone to express itself in an unquestioning devoutness and a naive and complacent submission to an inscrutable providence. It therefore, by preference, seeks affiliation with some one of those lay religious organizations which occupy themselves with the spread of the exoteric forms of faith, as, e.g., the Young Men's Christian Association, or the Young People's Society for Christian Endeavor. These lay bodies are organized to further practical religion, as if to enforce the argument and firmly establish the close relationship between the sporting temperament and the archaic devoutness. These lay religious bodies commonly devote some appreciable portion of their energies to the furtherance of athletic contests and similar games of chance and skill. It might even be said that sports of this kind are apprehended to have some efficacy as a means of grace. They are apparently useful as a means of proselyting and as a means of sustaining the devout attitude in converts once made. That is to say, the games which give exercise to the animistic sense and to the emulative propensity help to form and to conserve that habit of mind to which the more exoteric cults are congenial. Hence, in the hands of the lay organizations, these sporting activities come to do duty as a novitiate or a means of induction into that fuller unfolding of the life of spiritual status which is the privilege of the full communicant along. That the exercise of the emulative and lower animistic proclivities are substantially useful for the devout purpose seems to be placed beyond question by the fact that the priesthood of many denominations is following the lead of the lay organizations in this respect. Those ecclesiastical organizations, especially which stand nearest the lay organizations in their insistence on practical religion, have gone some way towards adopting these or analogous practices in connection with the traditional devout observances. So there are boys' brigades and other organizations under clerical sanction acting to develop the emulative proclivity and the sense of status in the youthful members of the congregation. These pseudo-military organizations tend to elaborate and accentuate the proclivity to emulation and invidious comparison, and so strengthen the native facility for discerning and approving the relation of personal mastery and subservience. And a believer is eminently a person who knows how to obey and accept chastisement with good grace, but the habits of thought which these practices foster and conserve 
make up but one half of the substance of the anthropomorphic cults. The other, complementary element of devout life, the animistic habit of mind, is recruited and conserved by a second range of practices organized under clerical sanction. These are the class of gambling practices, of which the church bazaar or raffle may be taken as the type, as indicating the degree of legitimacy of these practices in connection with devout observances proper, it is to be remarked that these raffles, and the like trivial opportunities for gambling, seem to appeal with more effect to the common run of the members of religious organizations than they do to persons of a less devout habit of mind. All this seems to argue, on the one hand, that the same temperament inclines people to sports as inclines them to the anthropomorphic cults, and on the other hand, that the habituation to sports, perhaps especially to athletic sports, acts to develop the propensities which find satisfaction in devout observances. Conversely, it also appears that habituation to these observances favors the growth of a proclivity for athletic sports and for all games that give play to the habit of invidious comparison and of the appeal to luck. Substantially, the same range of propensities finds expression in both these directions of the spiritual life, that barbarian human nature in which the predatory instinct and the animistic standpoint predominate is normally prone to both. The predatory habit of mind involves an accentuated sense of personal dignity and of the relative standing of individuals. The social structure in which the predatory habit has been the dominant factor in the shaping of institutions is a structure based on status. The pervading norm in the predatory community's scheme of life is the relation of superior and inferior, noble and base, dominant and subservient persons and classes master and slave. The anthropomorphic cults have come down from that stage of industrial development and have been shaped by the same scheme of economic differentiation, a differentiation into consumer and producer, and they are pervaded by the same dominant principle of mastery and subservience. The cults impute to their divinity the habits of thought answering to the stage of economic differentiation at which the cults took shape. The anthropomorphic divinity is conceived to be punctilious in all questions of precedence and is prone to an assertion of mastery and an arbitrary exercise of power, an habitual resort to force as the final arbiter. In the later and maturer formulations of the anthropomorphic creed, this imputed habit of dominance on the part of a divinity of awful presence and inscrutable power is chastened into the fatherhood of God. The spiritual attitude and the aptitudes imputed to the preternatural agent are still such as belong under the regime of status, but they now assume the patriarchal caste characteristic of the quasi-peaceable stage of culture. Still, it is to be noted that even in this advanced phase of the cult of the observances in which devoutness finds expression consistently aimed to propitiate the divinity by extolling his greatness and glory and by professing subservience and fealty. The act of propitiation or of worship is designed to appeal to a sense of status imputed to the inscrutable power that is thus approached. The propitiary formulas most in vogue are still such as carry or imply an invidious comparison. A loyal attachment to the person of an anthropomorphic divinity endowed with such an archaic human nature implies the like archaic propensities in the devotee. For the purposes of economic theory, the relation of fealty, whether to a physical or to an extra-physical person, is to be taken as a variant of that personal subservience which makes up so large a share of the predatory and the quasi-peaceable scheme of life. The barbarian conception of the divinity as a warlike chieftain inclined to an overbearing manner of government has been greatly softened through the milder manners and the soberer habits of life that characterize those cultural phases which lie between the early predatory stage and the present. But even after this chastening of the devout fancy and the consequent mitigation of the harsher traits of conduct and character that are currently imputed to the divinity, there still remains in the popular apprehension of the divine nature and temperament a very substantial residue of the barbarian conception. So it comes about, for instance, 
but in characterizing the divinity and his relations to the process of human life, speakers and writers are still able to make effective use of similes borrowed from the vocabulary of war and of the predatory manner of life, as well as of locutions which involve an invidious comparison. Figures of speech of this import are used with good effect even in addressing the less warlike modern audiences, made up of adherents of the blander variants of the creed. This effective use of barbarian epithets and terms of comparison by popular speakers argues that the modern generation has retained a lively appreciation of the dignity and merit of the barbarian virtues, and it argues also that there is a degree of congruity between the devout attitude and the predatory habit of mind. It is only on second thought, if at all, that the devout fancy of modern worshippers revolts at the imputation of ferocious and vengeful emotions and actions to the object of their adoration. It is a matter of common observation that sanguinary epithets applied to the divinity have a high aesthetic and horrific value in the popular apprehension. That is to say, suggestions which these epithets carry are very acceptable to our unreflecting apprehension. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. End of the first part of chapter 12. Recording by Matthew Westra. Section 29 of The Theory of the Leisure Class This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Westra The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen Second Part of Chapter 12 Devout Observances the guiding habits of thought of a devout person move on the plane of an archaic scheme of life which has outlived much of its usefulness for the economic exigencies of the collective life of today. In so far as the economic organization fits the exigencies of the collective life of today, it has outlived the regime of status and has no use and no place for a relation of personal subserviency. So far as concerns the economic efficiency of the community, the sentiment of personal fealty and the general habit of mind of which that sentiment is an expression are survivals which cumber the ground and hinder an adequate adjustment of human institutions to the existing situation. The habit of mind which best lends itself to the purposes of a peaceable industrial community is that matter-of-fact temper which recognizes the value of material facts simply as opaque items in the mechanical sense. It is that frame of mind which does not instinctively impute an animistic propensity to things, nor resort to preternatural intervention as an explanation of perplexing phenomena, nor depend on an unseen hand to shape the course of events to human use. To meet the requirements of the highest economic efficiency under modern conditions, the world process must habitually be apprehended in terms of quantitative, dispassionate force and sequence. As seen from the point of view of the later economic exigencies, devoutness is, perhaps in all cases, to be looked upon as a survival from an earlier phase of associated life, a mark of arrested spiritual development. Of course, it remains true that in a community where the economic structure is still substantially a system of status, where the attitude of the average of persons in the community is consequently shaped by and adapted to the relation of personal dominance and personal subservience, or where, for any other reason, of tradition or of inherited aptitude, the population as a whole is strongly inclined to devout observances. There is a devout habit of mind in any individual not in excess of the average of the community, must be taken simply as a detail of the prevalent habit of life. In this light, a devout individual in a devout community cannot be called a case of reversion since he is abreast of the average of the community, but as seen from the point of view of the modern industrial situation, exceptional devoutness, 
devotional zeal that rises appreciably above the average pitch of devoutness in the community may safely be set down as in all cases an atavistic trait it is of course equally legitimate to consider these phenomena from a different point of view they may be appreciated for a different purpose and the characterization here offered may be turned about in speaking from the point of view of the devotional interest or the interest of devout taste it may with equal cogency be said that the spiritual attitude bred in men by the modern industrial life is unfavorable to a free development of the life of faith it might fairly be objected to the latter development of the industrial process that its discipline tends to materialism to the elimination of filial piety from the aesthetic point of view again something to a similar purport might be said but however legitimate and valuable these and the like reflections may be for their purpose they would not be in place with the present inquiry which is exclusively concerned with the valuation of these phenomena from the economic point of view the grave economic significance of the anthropomorphic habit of mind and of the addiction to devout observances must serve as apology for speaking further on a topic which it cannot but be distasteful to discuss at all as an economic phenomenon in a community so devout as ours devout observances are of economic importance as an index of a concomitant variation of temperament accompanying the predatory habit of mind and so indicating the presence of industrially disserviceable traits they indicate the presence of a mental attitude which has a certain economic value of its own by virtue of its influence upon the industrial serviceability of the individual, but they are also of importance, more directly, in modifying the economic activities of the community, especially as regards the distribution and consumption of goods, on which an anthropomorphic cult rests. That is to say, they further the habits of thought characteristic of the regime of status. They are, in so far, an obstruction to the most effective organization of industry under modern circumstances, and are, in the first instance, antagonistic to the development of economic institutions in the direction required by the situation of today. For the present purpose, the indirect as well as the direct effects of this consumption are of the nature of a curtailment of the community's economic efficiency. In economics theory, then, and considered in its proximate consequences, the consumption of goods and effort in the service of an anthropomorphic divinity means a lowering of the vitality of the community. What may be the remoter, indirect moral effects of this class of consumption does not admit of a succinct answer, and it is a question which cannot be taken up here. It will be to the point, however, to note the general economic character of devout consumption in comparison with consumption for other purposes, an indication of the range of motives and purposes from which devout consumption of goods proceeds will help toward an appreciation of the value both of this consumption itself and of the general habit of mind to which it is congenial. There is a striking parallelism, if not rather a substantial identity of motive, between the consumption which goes to the service of an anthropomorphic divinity and that which goes to the service of a gentleman of leisure, chieftain, or patriarch in the upper class of society during the barbarian culture. Both in the case of the chieftain and in that of the divinity there are expensive edifices set apart for the behoof of the person served, these edifices, as well as the properties which supplement them in the service, must not be common in kind or grade. They always show a large element of conspicuous waste. It may also be noted that the devout edifices are invariably of an archaic cast in their structure and fittings. So also the servants, both of the chieftain and of the divinity, must appear in the presence clothed in garments of a special ornate character. The characteristic economic feature of this apparel is a more than ordinarily accentuated conspicuous waste, together with the secondary feature, more accentuated in the case of the priestly servants than in that of the servants or courtiers of the barbarian potentate. That this court dress must always be in some degree of an archaic fashion. 
Also, the garments worn by the lay members of the community when they come into the presence should be of a more expensive kind than their everyday apparel. Here, again, the parallelism between the usage of the chieftain's audience hall and that of the sanctuary is fairly well marked. In this respect, there is required a certain ceremonial cleanness of attire, the essential feature of which, in the economic respect, is that the garments worn on these occasions should carry as little suggestion as may be of any industrial occupation or of any habitual addiction to such employments as are of material use. And this requirement of conspicuous waste and of ceremonial cleanness from the traces of industry extends also to the apparel and in a less degree to the food which is consumed on sacred holidays, that is to say, on days set apart, taboo, for the divinity or for some member of the lower ranks of the preternatural leisure class. In economic theory, sacred holidays are obviously to be construed as a season of vicarious leisure performed for the divinity or saint in whose name the taboo is imposed, and to whose good repute the abstention from useful effort on these days is conceived to inure. The characteristic feature of all such seasons of devout vicarious leisure is a more or less rigid taboo on all activity that is of human use. In the case of fast days, the conspicuous abstention from gainful occupations and from all pursuits that, materially, further human life is further accentuated by compulsory abstinence from such consumption as would conduce to the comfort or the fullness of the life of the consumer. It may be remarked, parenthetically, that secular holidays are of the same origin by slightly remoter derivation. They shade off by degrees from the genuinely sacred days through an intermediate class of semi-sacred birthdays of kings and great men who have been in some measure canonized to the deliberately invented holiday set apart to further the good repute of some notable event or some striking fact to which it is intended to do honor or the good fame of which is felt to be in need of repair. The remoter refinement in the employment of vicarious leisure as a means of augmenting the good repute of a phenomenon or datum is seen at its best in its very latest application. A day of vicarious leisure has in some communities been set apart as Labor Day. This observance is designed to augment the prestige of the fact of labor by the archaic predatory method of a compulsory abstention from useful effort. To this datum of labor in general is imputed the good repute attributable to the pecuniary strength put in evidence by abstaining from labor. Sacred holidays, and holidays generally, are of the nature of a tribute levied on the body of the people. The tribute is paid in vicarious leisure, and the honorific effect which emerges is imputed to the person or the fact for whose good repute the holiday has been instituted. Such a tithe of vicarious leisure is a perquisite of all members of the preternatural leisure class, and is indispensable to their good fame. Un sanquon ne champa is indeed a saint fallen on evil days. Besides this tithe of vicarious leisure levied on the laity, there are also special classes of persons, the various grades of priests and hierodules, whose time is wholly set apart for a similar service. It is not only incumbent on the priestly class to abstain from vulgar labor, especially so far as it is lucrative or is apprehended to contribute to the temporal well-being of mankind. The taboo in this case of the priestly class goes farther and adds a refinement in the form of an injunction against their seeking worldly gain, even where it may be had, without debasing application to industry. It is felt to be unworthy of the servant of the divinity, or rather unworthy the dignity of the divinity whose servant he is, that he should seek material gain or take thought for temporal matters. Of all contemptible things, a man who pretends to be a priest of God and is a priest to his own comforts and ambitions is the most contemptible. There is a line of discrimination which a cultivated taste in matters of devout observance finds little difficulty in drawing 
between such actions and conduct as conduce to the fullness of human life and such as conduce to the good fame of the anthropomorphic divinity and the activity of the priestly class in the ideal barbarian scheme falls wholly on the hither side of this line what falls within the range of economics falls below the proper line of solicitude of the priesthood in its best estate such apparent exceptions to this rule as are afforded for instance by some of the medieval orders of monks the members of which actually labored to some useful end scarcely impugn the rule these outlying orders of the priestly class are not a sacerdotal element in the full sense of the term and it is noticeable also that these doubtfully sacerdotal orders which countenanced their members in earning a living fell into disrepute through offending the sense of propriety in the communities where they existed the priest should not put his hand to mechanically productive work but he should consume in large measure but even as regards his consumption it is to be noted that it should take such forms as do not obviously conduce to his own comfort or fullness of life it should conform to the rules governing vicarious consumption as explained under that head in an earlier chapter it is not ordinarily in good form for the priestly class to appear well fed or in hilarious spirits indeed in many of the more elaborate cults the injunction against other than vicarious consumption by this class frequently goes so far as to enjoin mortification of the flesh and even in those modern denominations which have been organized under the latest formulations of the creed in a modern industrial community it is felt that all levity and avowed zest in the enjoyment of the good things of this world is alien to the true clerical decorum whatever suggests that these servants of an invisible master are living a life not of devotion to their master's good fame but of application to their own ends jars harshly on our sensibilities as something fundamentally and eternally wrong they are a servant class although being servants of a very exalted master they rank high in the social scale by virtue of this borrowed light their consumption is vicarious consumption and since in the advanced cults their master has no need of material gain their occupation is vicarious leisure in the full sense whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do do all to the glory of god it may be added that so far as the laity is assimilated to the priesthood in the respect that they are conceived to be servants of the divinity so far this imputed vicarious character attaches also to the layman's life the range of application of this corollary is somewhat wide it applies especially to such movements for the reform or rehabilitation of the religious life as are of an austere pietistic ascetic caste where the human subject is conceived to hold his life by a direct servile tenure from his spiritual sovereign that is to say where the institution of the priesthood lapses or where there is an exceptionally lively sense of the immediate and masterful presence of the divinity in the affairs of life there the layman is conceived to stand in an immediate servile relation to the divinity and his life is construed to be a performance of vicarious leisure directed to the enhancement of his master's repute in such cases of reversion there is a return to the unmediated relation of subservience as the dominant fact of the devout attitude the emphasis is thereby thrown on an austere and discomforting vicarious leisure to the neglect of conspicuous consumption as a means of grace and of second part of chapter 12 recording by matthew westra section 30 of the theory of the leisure class this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by matthew westra 
The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. Third part of Chapter 12, Devout Observances. A doubt will present itself as to the full legitimacy of this characterization of the sacerdotal scheme of life on the ground that a considerable proportion of the modern priesthood departs from the scheme in many details. The scheme does not hold good for the clergy of those denominations which have in some measure diverged from the old established schedule of beliefs or observances. These take thought, at least ostensibly or permissively, for the temporal welfare of the laity as well as for their own. Their manner of life, not only in the privacy of their own household, but often, even before the public, does not differ in an extreme degree from that of secular-minded persons, either in its ostensible austerity or in the archaism of its apparatus. This is truest for those denominations that have wandered the farthest. To this objection, it is to be said, that we have here to do not with a discrepancy in the theory of sacerdotal life, but with an imperfect conformity to the scheme on the part of this body of clergy. They are but a partial and imperfect representative of the priesthood, and must not be taken as exhibiting the sacerdotal scheme of life in an authentic and competent manner. The clergy of the sects and denominations might be characterized as a half-caste priesthood, or a priesthood in process of becoming, or of reconstitution. Such a priesthood may be expected to show the characteristics of the sacerdotal office only as blended and obscured with alien motives and traditions, due to the disturbing presence of other factors than those of animism and status in the purposes of the organizations to which this non-conforming fraction of the priesthood belongs. Appeal may be taken direct to the taste of any person with a discriminating and cultivated sense of the sacerdotal proprieties, or to the prevalent sense of what constitutes clerical decorum in any community at all accustomed to think, or to pass criticism on what a clergyman may or may not do without blame. Even in the most extremely secularized denominations there is some sense of a distinction that should be observed between the sacerdotal and the lay scheme of life. There is no person of sensibility but feels that where the members of this denominational or sectarian clergy depart from traditional usage in the direction of a less austere or less archaic demeanor and apparel, they are departing from the ideal of priestly decorum. There is probably no community and no sect within the range of the Western culture in which the bounds of permissible indulgence are not drawn appreciably closer for the incumbent of the priestly office than for the common layman. If the priest's own sense of sacerdotal propriety does not effectually impose a limit, the prevalent sense of the proprieties on the part of the community will commonly assert itself so obtrusively as to lead to his conformity or his retirement from office. Few, if any, members of any body of clergy, it may be added, would avowedly seek an increase of salary for gain's sake, and if such avowal were openly made by a clergyman, it would be found obnoxious to the sense of propriety among his congregation. It may also be noted, in this connection, that no one but the scoffers and the very obtuse are not instinctively grieved inwardly at a jest from the pulpit and that there are none whose respect for their pastor does not suffer through any mark of levity on his part in any conjuncture of life except it be levity of a palpably histrionic kind, a constrained unbending of dignity. The diction proper to the sanctuary and to the priestly office should also carry little, if any, suggestion of effective everyday life, and should not draw upon the vocabulary of modern trade or industry, Likewise, one's sense of the proprieties is readily offended by too detailed and intimate a handling of industrial and other purely human questions at the hands of the clergy. There is a certain level of generality below which a cultivated sense of the proprieties in homilectical discourse will not permit a well-bred clergyman to decline in his discussion of temporal interests. These matters that are of human and secular consequence simply should properly be handled with such a degree of generality and aloofness as may imply that the speaker represents a master whose interest in secular affairs goes only so far as to permissively countenance them. 
it is further to be noticed that the non-conforming sects and variants whose priesthood is here under discussion vary among themselves in the degree of their conformity to the ideal scheme of sacerdotal life in a general way it will be found that the divergence in this respect is widest in the case of the relatively young denominations and especially in the case of such of the newer denominations as have chiefly a lower middle-class constituency they commonly show a large admixture of humanitarian philanthropic or other motives which cannot be classed as expressions of the devotional attitude such as the desire of learning or of conviviality which enter largely into the effective interest shown by members of these organizations the non-conforming or sectarian movements have commonly proceeded from a mixture of motives some of which are at variance with that sense of status on which the priestly office rests sometimes indeed the motive has been in good part a revulsion against a system of status where this is the case the institution of the priesthood has broken down in the transition at least partially the spokesman of such an organization is at the outset a servant and representative of the organization rather than a member of a special priestly class and the spokesman of a divine master and it is only by a process of gradual specialization that in succeeding generations this spokesman regains the position of priest with a full investiture of sacerdotal authority and with its accompanying austere archaic and vicarious manner of life the like is true of the breakdown and redintegration of devout ritual after such a revulsion the priestly office the scheme of sacerdotal life and the schedule of devout observances are rehabilitated only gradually insensibly and with more or less variation in details as a persistent human sense of devout propriety reasserts its primacy in questions touching the interest in the preternatural and it may be added as the organization increases in wealth and so acquires more of the point of view and the habits of thought of a leisure class beyond the priestly class and ranged in an ascending hierarchy ordinarily comes a superhuman vicarious leisure class of saints angels etc or their equivalents in the ethnic cults these rise in grade one above another according to elaborate system of status the principle of status runs through the entire hierarchical system both visible and invisible the good fame of these several orders of the supernatural hierarchy also commonly requires a certain tribute of vicarious consumption and vicarious leisure in many cases they accordingly have devoted to their service suborders of attendants or dependents who perform a vicarious leisure for them after much the same fashion as was found in an earlier chapter to be true of the dependent leisure class under the patriarchal system it may not appear without reflection how these devout observances and the peculiarity of temperament which they imply or the consumption of goods and services which is comprised in the cult stand related to the leisure class of a modern community or to the economic motives of which that class is the exponent in the modern scheme of life to this end a summary review of certain facts bearing on this relation will be useful it appears from an earlier passage in this discussion that for the purpose of the collective life of today, especially so far as concerns the industrial efficiency of the modern community, the characteristic traits of the devout temperament are a hindrance rather than a help. It should accordingly be found that the modern industrial life tends selectively to eliminate these traits of human nature from the spiritual constitution of the classes that are immediately engaged in the industrial process. It should hold true, approximately, that devoutness is declining or tending to obsolescence among the members of what may be called the effective industrial community. At the same time, it should appear that this aptitude or habit survives in appreciably greater vigor among those classes which do not immediately or primarily enter into the community's life process as an industrial factor. It has already been pointed out that these latter classes, which live by rather than in the industrial process, are roughly comprised under two categories. One, 
the leisure class proper, which is shielded from the stress of the economic situation, and two, the indigent classes, including the lower class delinquents, which are unduly exposed to the stress. In the case of the former class, an archaic habit of mind persists because no effectual economic pressure constrains this class to an adaptation of its habits of thought to the changing situation, while in the latter the reason for a failure to adjust their habits of thought to the altered requirements of industrial efficiency is innutrition, absence of such surplus of energy as is needed in order to make the adjustment with facility, together with a lack of opportunity to acquire and become habituated to the modern point of view. The trend of the selective process runs in much the same direction in both cases. From the point of view which the modern industrial life inculcates, phenomena are habitually subsumed under the quantitative relation of mechanical sequence. The indigent classes not only fall short of the modicum of leisure necessary in order to appropriate and assimilate the more recent generalizations of science which this point of view involves, but they also ordinarily stand in such a relation of personal dependence or subservience to their pecuniary superiors as materially to retard their emancipation from habits of thought proper to the regime of status. The result is that these classes in some measure retain that general habit of mind, the chief expression of which is a strong sense of personal status, and of which devoutness is one feature. In the older communities of the European culture, the hereditary leisure class, together with the mass of the indigent population, are given to devout observances in an appreciably higher degree than the average of the industrious middle class, wherever a considerable class of the latter character exists. But in some of these countries, the two categories of conservative humanity named above comprise virtually the whole population. Where these two classes greatly preponderate, their bent shapes popular sentiment to such an extent as to bear down any possible divergent tendency in the inconsiderable middle class and imposes a devout attitude upon the whole community. This must, of course, not be construed to say that such communities or such classes as are exceptionally prone to devout observances tend to conform in any exceptional degree to the specifications of any code of morals that we may be accustomed to associate with this or that confession of faith. A large measure of the devout habit of mind need not carry with it a strict observance of the injunctions of the Decalogue or of the common law. Indeed, it is becoming somewhat of a commonplace with observers of criminal life in European communities that the criminal and dissolute classes are, if anything, rather more devout and more naively so than the average of the population. It is among those who constitute the pecuniary middle class and the body of law-abiding citizens that a relative exemption from the devotional attitude is to be looked for. Those who best appreciate the merits of the higher creeds and observances would object to all this and say that the devoutness of the low-class delinquents is a spurious, or at the best, a superstitious devoutness, and the point is no doubt well taken and goes directly and cogently to the purpose intended. But for the purpose of the present inquiry, these extra-economic, extra-psychological distinctions must perforce be neglected, however valid and however decisive they may be for the purpose for which they are made. What has actually taken place with regard to class emancipation from the habit of devout observance is shown by the latter-day complaint of the clergy that the churches are losing the sympathy of the artisan classes, and are losing their hold upon them. At the same time, it is currently believed that the middle class, commonly so called, is also falling away in the cordiality of its support of the church, especially so far as regards the adult male portion of that class. These are currently recognized phenomena, and it might seem that a simple reference to these facts should sufficiently substantiate the general position outlined. Such an appeal to the general phenomena of popular church attendance and church membership may be sufficiently convincing for the proposition here advanced, but it will still be to the purpose to trace in some detail the course of events and the particular forces 
which have wrought this change in the spiritual attitude of the more advanced industrial communities of today. It will serve to illustrate the manner in which economic causes work towards a secularization of men's habits of thought. In this respect, the American community should afford an exceptionally convincing illustration. Since this community has been the least trammeled by external circumstances of any equally important industrial aggregate, after making due allowance for exceptions and sporadic departures from the normal, the situation here at the present time may be summarized quite briefly. As a general rule, the classes that are low in economic efficiency, or in intelligence, or both, are peculiarly devout. As, for instance, the Negro population of the South, much of the lower class foreign population, much of the rural population, especially in those sections which are backward in education, in the stage of development of the air industry, or in respect of their industrial contact with the rest of the community. So also such fragments as we possess of a specialized or hereditary indigent class, or of a segregated criminal or dissolute class, although among these latter the devout habit of mind is apt to take the form of a naive animistic belief in luck and in the efficacy of shamanistic practices, perhaps more frequently than it takes the form of a formal adherence to any accredited creed. The artisan class, on the other hand, is notoriously falling away from the accredited anthropomorphic creeds and from all devout observances. This class is, in an especial degree, exposed to the characteristic intellectual and spiritual stress of modern organized industry, which requires a constant recognition of the undisguised phenomena of impersonal matter-of-fact sequence and an unreserved conformity to the law of cause and effect. This class is, at the same time, not underfed, nor overworked to such an extent as to leave no margin of energy for the work of adaptation. The case of the lower or doubtful leisure class in America, the middle class commonly so called, is somewhat peculiar. It differs in respect of its devotional life from its European counterpart, but it differs in degree and method rather than in substance. The churches still have the pecuniary support of this class, although the creeds to which the class adheres with the greatest facility are relatively poor in anthropomorphic content. At the same time, the effective middle-class congregation tends, in many cases, more or less remotely perhaps, to become a congregation of women and minors. There is an appreciable lack of devotional fervor among the adult males of the middle class, although to a considerable extent there survives among them a certain complacent, reputable assent to the outlines of the accredited creed under which they were born. Their everyday life is carried on in a more or less close contact with the industrial process. End of third part of chapter 12. Recording by Matthew Westra. Section 31 of The Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Westra. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. Fourth Part of Chapter 12, Devout Observances. This peculiar sexual differentiation, which tends to delegate devout observances to the women and their children, is due at least in part to the fact that the middle-class women are in great measure a vicarious leisure class. The same is true in a less degree of the women of the lower artisan classes. They live under a regime of status handed down from an earlier stage of industrial development, and thereby they preserve a frame of mind and habits of thought which incline them to an archaic view of things generally. At the same time, they stand in no such direct organic relation to the industrial process at large as would tend strongly to break down those habits of thought which, for the modern industrial purpose, are obsolete. 
That is to say, the peculiar devoutness of women is a particular expression of that conservatism which the women of civilized communities owe, in a great measure, to their economic position. For the modern man, the patriarchal relation of status is by no means a dominant feature of life, but for the women, on the other hand, and for the upper middle class women especially, confined as they are by prescription and by economic circumstances to their domestic sphere, this relation is the most real and most formative factor of life. Hence, a habit of mind favorable to devout observances and to the interpretation of the facts of life generally in terms of personal status. The logic and the logical processes of her everyday domestic life are carried over into the realm of the supernatural, and the woman finds herself at home and content in a range of ideas which, to the man, are in great measure alien and imbecile. Still the men of this class are also not devoid of piety, although it is commonly not piety of an aggressive or exuberant kind. The men of the upper middle class commonly take a more complacent attitude towards devout observances than the men of the artisan class. This may perhaps be explained in part by saying that what is true of the women of the class is true to a less extent also of the men. They are, to an appreciable extent, a sheltered class, and the patriarchal relation of status which still persists in their conjugal life and in their habitual use of servants may also act to conserve an archaic habit of mind and may exercise a retarding influence upon the process of secularization which their habits of thought are undergoing. The relations of the American middle-class man to the economic community, however, are usually pretty close and exacting, although it may be remarked, by the way, and in qualification, that their economic activity frequently also partakes in some degree of the patriarchal or quasi-predatory character. The occupations which are in good repute among this class and which have most to do with shaping the class habits of thought are the pecuniary occupations which have been spoken of in a similar connection in an earlier chapter. There is a good deal of the relation of arbitrary command and submission, and not a little of shrewd practice, remotely akin to predatory fraud. All this belongs on the plane of life of the predatory barbarian, to whom a devotional attitude is habitual. And, in addition to this, the devout observances also commend themselves to this class on the ground of reputability. But this latter incentive to piety deserves treatment by itself, and will be spoken of presently. There is no hereditary leisure class of any consequence in the American community, except in the South. This southern leisure class is somewhat given to devout observances, more so than any class of corresponding pecuniary standing in other parts of the country. It is also well known that the creeds of the South are of a more old-fashioned caste than their counterparts in the North. Corresponding to this more archaic devotional life of the South is the lower industrial development of that section. The industrial organization of the South is at present, and especially it has been until quite recently, of a more primitive character than that of the American community taken as a whole. It approaches nearer to handicraft in the paucity and rudeness of its mechanical appliances, and there is more of the element of mastery and subservience. It may also be noted that, owing to the peculiar economic circumstances of this section, the greater devoutness of the southern population, both white and black, is correlated with a scheme of life which in many ways recalls the barbarian stages of industrial development. Among this population, offenses of an archaic character also are and have been relatively more prevalent and are less deprecated than they are elsewhere, as, for example, duels, brawls, feuds, drunkenness, horse racing, cockfighting, gambling, male sexual incontinence, evidenced by the considerable number of mulattoes. There is also a livelier sense of honor, an expression of sportsmanship, and a derivative of predatory life. 
As regards the wealthier class of the North, the American leisure class, in the best sense of the term, it is, to begin with, scarcely possible to speak of an hereditary devotional attitude. This class is of too recent growth to be possessed of a well-formed, transmitted habit in this respect, or even of a special home-grown tradition. Still, it may be noted in passing that there is a perceptible tendency among this class to give in at least a nominal, and apparently something of a real, adherence to some one of the accredited creeds. Also, weddings, funerals, and the like honorific events among this class are pretty uniformly solemnized, with some especial degree of religious circumstance. It is impossible to say how far this adherence to a creed is a bona fide reversion to a devout habit of mind, and how far it is to be classed as a case of protected mimicry assumed for the purpose of an outward assimilation to canons of reputability borrowed from foreign ideals. Something of a substantial devotional propensity seems to be present, to judge especially by the somewhat peculiar degree of ritualistic observance which is in process of development in the upper-class cults. There is a tendency perceptible among the upper-class worshippers to affiliate themselves with those cults which lay relatively great stress on ceremonial and on the spectacular accessories of worship, and in the churches, in which an upper-class membership predominates, there is at the same time a tendency to accentuate the realistic at the cost of the intellectual features in the service and in the apparatus of the devout observances. This holds true even where the church in question belongs to a denomination with a relatively slight general development of ritual and paraphernalia. This peculiar development of the ritualistic element is no doubt due in part to a predilection for conspicuously wasteful spectacles, but it probably also in part indicates something of the devotional attitude of the worshippers. So far as the latter is true, it indicates a relatively archaic form of the devotional habit. The predominance of spectacular effects in devout observances is noticeable in all devout communities at a relatively primitive stage of culture and with a slight intellectual development. It is especially characteristic of the barbarian culture. Here there is pretty uniformly present in the devout observances a direct appeal to the emotions through all the avenues of sense and a tendency to return to this naive, sensational method of appeal is unmistakable in the upper-class churches of today. It is perceptible in a less degree in the cults which claim the allegiance of the lower leisure class and of the middle classes. There is a reversion to the use of colored lights and brilliant spectacles, a freer use of cymbals, orchestral music, and incense, and one may even detect in processionals and recessionals, and in richly varied genuflectional evolutions, an incipient reversion to so antique an accessory of worship as the sacred dance. This reversion to spectacular observances is not confined to the upper-class cults, although it finds its best exemplification and its highest accentuation in the higher pecuniary and social altitudes. The cults of the lower-class devout portion of the community, such as the southern negroes and the backward foreign elements of the population, of course also show a strong inclination to ritual, symbolism, and spectacular effects, as might be expected from the antecedents and the cultural level of those classes. With these classes, the prevalence of ritual and anthropomorphism are not so much a matter of reversion as of continued development out of the past, but the use of ritual and related features of devotion are also spreading in other directions. In the early days of the American community, the prevailing denominations started out with a ritual and paraphernalia of an austere simplicity. But it is a matter familiar to every one that in the course of time these denominations have, in a varying degree, adopted much of the spectacular elements which they once renounced. In a general way, 
this development has gone hand in hand with the growth of the wealth and the ease of life of the worshippers, and has reached its fullest expression among those classes which grade highest in wealth and repute. The causes to which this pecuniary stratification of devoutness is due have already been indicated in a general way in speaking of class differences in habits of thought. Class differences as regards devoutness are but a special expression of a generic fact. The lax allegiance of the lower middle class, or what may broadly be called the failure of filial piety among this class, is chiefly perceptible among the town populations engaged in the mechanical industries. In a general way, one does not at the present time look for a blameless filial piety among those classes whose employment approaches that of the engineer and the mechanician. These mechanical employments are in a degree a modern fact. The handicraftsmen of earlier times, who served an industrial end of a character similar to that now served by the mechanician, were not similarly refractory under the discipline of devoutness. The habitual activity of the men engaged in these branches of industry has greatly changed as regards its intellectual discipline since the modern industrial processes have come into vogue, and the discipline to which the mechanician is exposed in his daily employment affects the methods and standards of his thinking also on topics which lie outside his everyday work. Familiarity with the highly organized and highly impersonal industrial processes of the present acts to derange the animistic habits of thought. The workman's office is becoming more and more exclusively that of discretion and supervision in a process of mechanical, dispassionate sequences. So long as the individual is the chief and typical prime mover in the process, so long as the obtrusive feature of the industrial process is the dexterity and force of the individual handicraftsman, so long as the habit of interpreting phenomena in terms of personal motive and propensity suffers no such considerable and consistent derangement through facts as to lead to its elimination. But under the later developed industrial processes, when the prime movers and the contrivances through which they work are of an impersonal, non-individual character, the grounds of generalization habitually present in the workman's mind and the point of view from which he habitually apprehends phenomena is an enforced cognizance of matter-of-fact sequence. The result, so far as concerns the workman's life of faith, is a proclivity to undevout skepticism. It appears, then, that the devout habit of mind attains its best development under a relatively archaic culture, the term devout being, of course, here used in its anthropological sense simply, and not as implying anything with respect to the spiritual attitude so characterized beyond the fact of a proneness to devout observances. It appears also that this devout attitude marks a type of human nature which is more in consonance with the predatory mode of life than with the later developed, more consistently and organically industrial life process of the community. It is, in large measure, an expression of the archaic habitual sense of personal status, the relation of mastery and subservience, and it therefore fits into the industrial scheme of the predatory and the quasi-peaceable culture, but does not fit into the industrial scheme of the present. It also appears that this habit persists with greatest tenacity among those classes in the modern communities whose everyday life is most remote from the mechanical processes of industry, and which are the most conservative also in other respects, while for those classes that are habitually in immediate contact with modern industrial processes, and whose habits of thought are therefore exposed to the constraining force of technological necessities, that animistic interpretation of phenomena and that respect of persons on which devout observance proceeds are in process of obsolescence. And also, as bearing especially on the present discussion, it appears that the devout habit to some extent progressively gains in scope and elaboration 
among those classes in the modern communities to whom wealth and leisure accrue in the most pronounced degree. In this, as in other relations, the institution of a leisure class acts to conserve and even to rehabilitate that archaic type of human nature and those elements of the archaic culture which the industrial evolution of society in its later stages acts to eliminate. End of chapter 12. Recording by Matthew Westra. Chapter 13 of Theory of the Leisure Class. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eugene Smith. Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorstein Veblen. Chapter 13 Survivals of the Non Invidious Interests. In an increasing proportion as time goes on, the anthropomorphic cult, with its code of devout observations, suffers a progressive disintegration through the stress of economic exigencies and the decay of the system of status. As this disintegration proceeds, there come to be associated and blended with the devout attitude certain other motives and impulses that are not always of an anthropomorphic origin, nor traceable to the habit of personal subservience. Not all of these subsidiary impulses that blend with the habit of devoutness in the later devotional life are altogether congruous with the devout attitude or with their anthropomorphic apprehension of the sequence of phenomena. The origin being not the same, their action upon the scheme of devout life is also not in the same direction. In many ways, they traverse the underlying norm of subservience or vicarious life to which the code of devout observations and the ecclesiastical and sacerdotal institutions are to be traced as their substantial basis, through the presence of these alien motives, the social and industrial regime of status gradually disintegrates, and the canon of personal subservience loses the support derived from an unbroken tradition. Extraneous habits and proclivities encroach upon the field of action occupied by this canon, and it presently comes about that the ecclesiastical and sacerdotal structures are partially converted to other uses, in some measure alien to the purposes of the scheme of devout life as it stood in the days of the most vigorous and characteristic development of the priesthood. Among these alien motives which affect the devout scheme in its later growth may be mentioned the motives of charity and of social good fellowship, or conviviality, or, in more general terms, the various expressions of the sense of human solidarity and sympathy. It may be added that these extraneous uses of the ecclesiastical structure contribute materially to its survival in name and form, even among people who may be ready to give up the substance of it. A still more characteristic and more pervasive alien element in the motives which have gone to formally uphold the scheme of devout life is that non-reverent sense of aesthetic congruity with the environment, which left as a residue of the latter-day act of worship after elimination of its anthropomorphic content. This has done good service for the maintenance of the sacerdotal institution through blending with the motive of subservience. This sense of impulse of aesthetic congruity is not primarily of an economic character, but it has a considerable indirect effect in shaping the habit of mind of the individual for economic purposes in the later stages of industrial development. Its most perceptible effect in this regard goes in the direction of mitigating the somewhat pronounced self-regarding bias that has been transmitted by tradition from the earlier, more competent phases of the regime of status, the economic bearing of this impulse is therefore seen to transverse that of the devout attitude. The former goes to qualify, if not eliminate, the self-regarding bias through sublation of the antithesis or antagonism of self and not-self, while the latter, being an expression of the sense of personal subservience and mastery, goes to accentuate this antithesis 
and to insist upon the divergence between the self-regarding interest and the interests of the generically human life process. This non-invidious residue of the religious life, the sense of communion with the environment or with the generic life process, as well as the impulse of charity or of sociability, act in a pervasive way to shape men's habits of thought for the economic purpose. But the action of all this class of proclivities is somewhat vague, and their effects are difficult to trace in detail. So much seems clear, however, as that the action of this entire class of motives or aptitudes tends in a direction contrary to the underlying principles of the institution of the leisure class as already formulated. The basis of that institution, as well as of the anthropomorphic cults associated with it in the cultural development, is the habit of invidious comparison. And this habit is incongruous with the exercise of the aptitudes now in question. The substantial canons of the leisure class scheme of life are a conspicuous waste of time and substance and a withdrawal from the industrial process while the particular aptitudes here in question assert themselves on the economic side in a deprecation of waste and of a futile manner of life and in an impulse to participation in or identification with the life process whether it be on the economic side or in any other of its phases or aspects it is plain that these aptitudes and habits of life to which they give rise where circumstances favor their expression, or where they assert themselves in a dominant way, run counter to the leisure class scheme of life, but it is not clear that life under the leisure class scheme, as seen in the later stages of its development, tends consistently to the repression of these aptitudes, or to exemption from the habits of thought in which they express themselves. The positive discipline of the leisure class scheme of life goes pretty much all the other way. In its positive discipline, by prescription and by selective elimination, the leisure class scheme favors the all-pervading and all-dominating primacy of the canons of waste and invidious comparison at every juncture of life. But in its negative effects, the tendency of the leisure class discipline is not so unequivocally true to the fundamental canons of the scheme in its regulation of human activity for the purpose of pecuniary decency, the leisure class canon insists on withdrawal from the industrial process. That is to say, it inhibits activity in the direction in which the impecunious members of the community habitually put forth their efforts, especially in the case of women, and more particularly as regards the upper class and upper middle class women of advanced industrial communities, this inhibition goes so far as to insist on withdrawal even from the emulative process of accumulation by the quasi-predator methods of the pecuniary occupations. The pecuniary, or the leisure class culture, which set out as an emulative variant of the impulse of workmanship, is in its latest development beginning to neutralize its own ground by eliminating the habit of invidious comparison in respect of efficiency or even a pecuniary standing. On the other hand, the fact that members of the leisure class, both men and women, are to some extent exempt from the necessity of finding a livelihood in the competitive struggle with their fellows makes it possible for members of this class not only to survive, but even, within bounds, to follow their bent in case they are not gifted with the aptitudes which make for success in the competitive struggle. That is to say, in the latest and fullest development of the institution, the livelihood of members of this class does not depend on the possession and the unremitting exercise of those aptitudes, and are therefore greater in the higher grades of the leisure class than in the general average of a population living under the competitive system. In an earlier chapter, in discussing the conditions of survival of archaic traits, it has appeared that the peculiar position of the leisure class affords exceptionally favorable chances for the survival of traits which characterize the type of human nature proper to an earlier and obsolete cultural stage. 
the class is sheltered from the stress of economic exigencies and is in this sense withdrawn from the rude impact of forces which make for adaptation to the economic situation. The survival in the leisure class and under the leisure class scheme of life of traits and types that are reminiscent of the predatory culture has already been discussed. These aptitudes and habits have an exceptionally favorable chance of survival under the leisure class regime. Not only does the sheltered pecuniary position of the leisure class afford a situation favorable to the survival of such individuals as are not gifted with the complement of aptitudes required for serviceability in the modern industrial process, but the leisure class canons of reputability at the same time enjoy the conspicuous exercise of certain predatory aptitudes. The employments in which the predatory aptitudes find exercise serve as an evidence of wealth, birth, and withdrawal from the industrial process. The survival of their predatory traits under the leisure class culture is furthered both negatively through the industrial exemption of the class and positively through the sanction of the leisure class canons of decency. With respect to the survival of traits characteristic of the anti predatory savage culture, the case is in some degree different. The sheltered position of the leisure class favors the survival also of these traits, but the exercise of the aptitudes for peace and goodwill does not have the affirmative sanction of the code of proprieties. Individuals gifted with a temperament that is reminiscent of the anti predatory culture are placed at something of an advantage within the leisure class as compared with similarly gifted individuals outside the class, in that they are not under a pecuniary necessity to thwart these aptitudes that make for a non-competitive life. But such individuals are still exposed to something of a moral constraint which urges them to disregard these inclinations, in that the code of proprieties enjoins upon them habits of life based on the predatory aptitudes. So long as the system of status remains intact, and so long as the leisure class has other lines of non-industrial activity to take to than obvious killing of time and aimless and wasteful fatigation, so long no considerable departure from the leisure class scheme of reputable life is to be looked for. The occurrence of non-predatory temperament with the class at that stage is to be looked upon as a case of sporadic reversion. But the reputable non-industrial outlets for the human propensity to action presently fail, through the advance of economic development, the disappearance of large game, the decline of war, the obsolescence of proprietary government, and the decay of the priestly office. When this happens, the situation begins to change. Human life must seek expression in one direction, if it may not in another, and if the predatory outlet fails, relief is sought elsewhere. As indicated above, the exemption from pecuniary stress has been carried farther in the case of the leisure class women of the advanced industrial communities than in that of any other considerable group of persons. The women may therefore be expected to show a more pronounced reversion to a non-invidious temperament than the men. But there is also among men of the leisure class a perceptible increase in the range and scope of activities that proceed from aptitudes which are not to be classed as self-regarding, and the end of which is not an invidious distinction. So, for instance, the greater number of men who have to do with industry in the way of pecuniarily managing an enterprise take some interest and some pride in seeing that the work is well done and is industrially effective, and this even apart from the profit which may result from any improvement of this kind. The efforts of commercial clubs and manufacturers' organizations in this direction of non-invidious advancement of industrial efficiency are also well known. The tendency to some other than an invidious purpose in life has worked out in a multitude of organizations, the purpose of which is some work of charity or of social amelioration. These organizations are often of a quasi-religious or pseudo-religious character and are participated in by both men and women. 
examples will present themselves in abundance on reflection, but for the purpose of indicating the range of the propensities in question, and of characterizing them, some of the more obvious concrete cases may be cited. Such, for instance, are the agitation for temperance and similar social reforms, for prison reform, for the spread of education, for the suppression of vice, and for the avoidance of war by arbitration, disarmament, or other means. Such are, in some measure, university settlements, neighborhood guilds, the various organizations typified by the Young Men's Christian Association and Young People's Society for Christian Endeavor, sewing clubs, art clubs, and even commercial clubs. Such are also, in some slight measure, the pecuniary foundations of semi-public establishments for charity, education, or amusement, whether they are endowed by wealthy individuals or by contributions collected from persons of smaller means, insofar as these establishments are not of a religious character. It is, of course, not intended to say that these efforts proceed entirely from other motives than those of a self-regarding kind. What can be claimed is that other motives are present in the common run of cases, and that the perceptibly greater prevalence of effort of this kind under the circumstances of the modern industrial life than under the unbroken regime of the principle of status indicates the presence in modern life of an effective skepticism with respect to the full legitimacy of an emulative scheme of life. It is a matter of sufficient notoriety to have become a commonplace jest that extraneous motives are commonly present among the incentives to this class of work, motives of a self-regarding kind, and especially the motive of an invidious distinction. To such an extent is this true that many ostensible works of disinterested public spirit are no doubt initiated and carried on with a view primarily to enhance the repute or even to the pecuniary gain of their promoters. In the case of some considerable groups of organizations or establishments of this kind, the invidious motive is apparently the dominant motive both with the initiators of the work and with their supporters. This last remark would hold true especially with respect to such works as lend distinction to their doer through large and conspicuous expenditure, as, for example, the foundation of a university or of a public library or museum. But it is also, and perhaps equally, true of the more commonplace work of participation in such organizations. These serve to authenticate the pecuniary reputability of their members, as well as gratefully to keep them in mind of their superior status by pointing the contrast between themselves and the lower-lying humanity in whom the work of amelioration is to be wrought. As, for example, the university settlement, which now has some vogue. But after all allowances and deductions have been made, there is left some remainder of motives of a non-emulative kind. The fact itself that distinction or decent good fame is sought by this method is evidence of a prevalent sense of the legitimacy and of the presumptive effectual presence of a non-emulative, non-invidious interest, a consistent factor in the habits of thought of modern communities. End of first part of chapter 13. Section 33 of the Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eugene Smith. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen, Second Part of Chapter 13, Survivals of the Non-Invidious Interests. In all this latter-day range of leisure class activities that proceed on the basis of a non-invidious and non-religious interest, it is to be noted that the women participate more actively and more persistently than the men, except, of course, in the case of such works as require a large expenditure of means. The dependent pecuniary position of the women disables them for work requiring large expenditure. 
as regards the general range of ameliorative work the members of the priesthood or clergy of the less naively devout sects or the secularized denominations are associated with the class of women this is as the theory would have it in other economic relations also this clergy stands in a somewhat equivocal position between the class of women and that of the men engaged in economic pursuits by tradition and by the prevalent sense of the proprieties both the clergy and the women of the well-to-do classes are placed in the position of a vicarious leisure class with both classes the characteristic relation which goes to form the habits of thought of the class is a relation of subservience that is to say an economic relation conceived in personal terms in both classes there is consequently perceptible a special proneness to construe phenomena in terms of personal relation rather than of causal sequence both classes are so inhibited by the canons of decency from the ceremonial unclean processes of the lucrative or productive occupations as to make participation in the industrial life process of today a moral impossibility for them the result of this ceremonial exclusion from productive effort of the vulgar sort is to draft a relatively large share of the energies of the modern feminine and priestly classes into the service of other interests than the self-regarding one the code leaves no alternative direction in which the impulse to purposeful action may find expression the effect of a consistent inhibition on industrially useful activity in the case of the leisure class women shows itself in a restless assertion of the impulse to workmanship in other directions than that of business activity as has been noticed already the everyday life of the well-to-do women and the clergy contains a larger element of status than that of the average of the men especially than that of the men engaged in the modern industrial occupations proper hence the devout attitude survives in a better state of preservation among these classes than among the common run of men in the modern communities. Hence, an appreciable share of the energy which seeks expression in a non-lucrative employment among these members of the vicarious leisure classes may be expected to eventuate in devout observances and works of piety. Hence, in part, the excess of the devout proclivity in women, spoken of in the last chapter. But it is more to the present point to note the effect of this proclivity in shaping the action and coloring the purposes of the non-lucrative movements and organizations here under discussion. Where this devout coloring is present, it lowers the immediate efficiency of the organizations for any economic end to which their efforts may be directed. Many organizations, charitable and ameliorative, divide their attention between the devotional and the secular well-being of the people whose interests they aim to further. It can scarcely be doubted that if they were to give an equally serious attention and effort undividedly to the secular interests of these people, the immediate economic value of their work should be appreciably higher than it is. It might, of course, similarly be said, if this were the place to say it, that the immediate efficiency of these works of amelioration for the devout might be greater if it were not hampered with the secular motives and aims which are usually present some deduction is to be made from the economic value of this class of non-invidious enterprise on account of the intrusion of the devotional interest but there are also deductions to be made on account of the presence of other alien motives which more or less broadly traverse the economic trend of this non-emulative expression of the instinct of workmanship to such an extent is this seen to be true on a closer scrutiny that when all is told it may even appear that this general class of enterprises is of an altogether dubious economic value, as measured in terms of the fullness or facility of life of the individuals or classes to whose amelioration the enterprise is directed. For instance, many of the efforts now in reputable vogue for the amelioration of the indigent population of large cities are of the nature, in great part, of a mission of culture, it is by this means sought to accelerate the rate of speed at which given elements of the upper-class culture find acceptance in the everyday scheme of life of the lower classes. The solicitude of settlements, for example, 
is in part directed to enhance the industrial efficiency of the poor and to teach them the more adequate utilization of the means at hand but it is also no less consistently directed to the inculcation by precept and example of certain punctilios of upper-class propriety in manners and customs the economic substance of these proprieties will commonly be found on scrutiny to be a conspicuous waste of time and goods those good people who go out to humanize the poor are commonly and advisedly extremely scrupulous and silently insistent in matters of decorum and the decencies of life they are commonly persons of an exemplary life and gifted with a tenacious insistence on ceremonial cleanness in the various items of their daily consumption the cultural or civilizing efficacy of this inculcation of correct habits of thought with respect to the consumption of time and commodities is scarcely to be overrated nor is its economic value to the individual who acquires these higher and more reputable ideals inconsiderable under the circumstances of the existing pecuniary culture the reputability and consequently the success of the individual is in great measure dependent on his proficiency in demeanor and methods of consumption that argue habitual waste of time and goods but as regards the ulterior economic bearing of this training in worthier methods of life it is to be said that the effect wrought is in large part a substitution of costlier or less efficient methods of accomplishing the same material results in relations where the material result is the fact of substantial economic value the propaganda of culture is in great part an inculcation of new tastes or rather of a new schedule of proprieties which have been adapted to the upper-class scheme of life under the guidance of the leisure class formulation of the principles of status and pecuniary decency this new schedule of proprieties is intruded into the lower class scheme of life from the code elaborated by an element of the population whose life lies outside the industrial process and this intrusive schedule can scarcely be expected to fit the exigencies of life for these lower classes more adequately than the schedule already in vogue among them and especially not more adequately than the schedule which they are themselves working out under the stress of modern industrial life all this of course does not question the fact that the proprieties of the substituted schedule are more decorous than those they displace the doubt which presents itself is simply a doubt as to the economic expediency of this work of regeneration that is to say the economic expediency in that immediate and material bearing in which the effects of the change can be ascertained with some degree of confidence and as viewed from the standpoint not of the individual but of the facility of life of the collectivity for an appreciation of the economic expediency of these enterprises of amelioration therefore their effective work is scarcely to be taken at its face value even where the aim of the enterprise is primarily an economic one and where the interest on which it proceeds is in no sense self-regarding or invidious the economic reform wrought is largely of the nature of a permutation in the methods of conspicuous waste but something further is to be said with respect to the character of the disinterested motives and canons of procedure in all work of this class that is affected by the habits of thought characteristic of the pecuniary culture and this further consideration may lead to a further qualification of the conclusions already reached as has been seen in an earlier chapter the canons of reputability or decency under the pecuniary culture insist on habitual futility of effort as the mark of a pecuniarily blameless life their results not only a habit of disesteem of useful occupations but their results also what is of more decisive consequence in guiding the action of any organized body of people that lays claim to social good repute there is a tradition which requires that one should not be vulgarly familiar with any of the processes or details that have to do with the material necessities of life one may meritoriously show a quantitative interest in the well-being of the vulgar through subscriptions or through work on managing committees and the like one may perhaps even more meritoriously show solicitude in general and in detail for the cultural welfare of the vulgar 
in the way of contrivances for elevating their tastes and affording them opportunities for spiritual amelioration but one should not betray an intimate knowledge of the material circumstances of vulgar life or of the habits of thought of the vulgar classes such as would effectually direct the efforts of these organizations to a materially useful end this reluctance to avow an unduly intimate knowledge of the lower class conditions of life in detail of course prevails in very different degrees in different individuals but there is commonly enough of it present collectively in any organization of the kind in question profoundly to influence its course of action by its cumulative action in shaping the usage and precedence of any such body this shrinking from an imputation of unseemly familiarity with vulgar life tends gradually to set aside the initial motives of the enterprise in favor of certain guiding principles of good repute ultimately reducible to terms of pecuniary merit so that in an organization of long standing the initial motive of furthering the facility of life in these classes comes gradually to be an ostensible motive only and the vulgarly effective work of the organization tends to obsolescence what is true of the efficiency of organizations for non-invidious work in this respect is true also as regards the work of individuals proceeding on the same motives though it perhaps holds true with more qualification for individuals than for organized enterprises the habit of gauging merit by the leisure class canons of wasteful expenditure and unfamiliarity with vulgar life whether on the side of production or of consumption is necessarily strong in the individuals who aspire to do some work of public utility and if the individual should forget his station and turn his efforts to vulgar effectiveness the common sense of the community the sense of pecuniary decency would presently reject his work and set him right an example of this is seen in the administration of bequests made by public-spirited men for the single purpose at least ostensibly of furthering the facility of human life in some particular respect the objects for which bequests of this class are most frequently made at present are schools libraries hospitals and asylums for the infirm or unfortunate the avowed purpose of the donor in these cases is the amelioration of human life in the particular respect which is named in the bequest but it will be found an invariable rule that in the execution of the work not a little of other motives frequently incompatible with the initial motive is present and determines the particular disposition eventually made of a good share of the means which have been set apart by the bequest certain funds for instance may have been set apart as a foundation for a foundling asylum or a retreat for invalids a diversion of expenditure to honorific waste in such cases is not uncommon enough to cause surprise or even to raise a smile an appreciable share of the funds is spent in the construction of an edifice faced with some aesthetically objectionable but expensive stone covered with grotesque and incongruous details and designed in its battlemented walls and turrets and its massive portals and strategic approaches to suggest certain barbaric methods of warfare the interior of the structure shows the same pervasive guidance of the canons of conspicuous waste and predatory exploit the windows for instance to go no farther into detail are placed with a view to impress their pecuniary excellence upon the chance beholder from the outside rather than with a view to effectiveness for their ostensible end in the convenience or comfort of the beneficiaries within and the detail of interior arrangement is required to conform itself as best it may to this alien but imperious requirement of pecuniary beauty in all this of course it is not to be presumed that the donor would have found fault or that he would have done otherwise if he had taken control in person it appears that in those cases where such a personal direction is exercised where the enterprise is conducted by direct expenditure and superintendence instead of by bequest the aims and methods of management are not different in this respect nor would the beneficiaries or the outside observers whose ease or vanity are not immediately touched be pleased with a different disposition of the funds 
it would suit no one to have the enterprise conducted with a view directly to the most economical and effective use of the means at hand for the initial material end of the foundation all concerned whether their interest is immediate and self-regarding or contemplative only agree that some considerable share of the expenditure should go to the higher or spiritual needs derived from the habit of an invidious comparison in predatory exploit and pecuniary waste but this only goes to say that the canons of emulative and pecuniary reputability so far pervade the common sense of the community as to permit no escape or evasion even in the case of an enterprise which ostensibly proceeds entirely on the basis of a non-invidious interest it may even be that the enterprise owes its honorific virtue as a means of enhancing the donor's good repute to the imputed presence of this non-invidious motive but that does not hinder the invidious interest from guiding the expenditure the effectual presence of motives of an emulative or invidious origin in non-emulative works of this kind might be shown at length and with detail in any one of the classes of enterprise spoken of above where these honorific details occur in such cases they commonly masquerade under designations that belong in the field of the aesthetic ethical or economic interest these special motives derived from the standards and canons of the pecuniary culture act surreptitiously to divert effort of a non-invidious kind from effective service without disturbing the agent's sense of good intention or obtruding upon his consciousness the substantial futility of his work their effect might be traced through the entire range of that schedule of non-invidious meliorative enterprise that is so considerable a feature and especially so conspicuous a feature in the overt scheme of life of the well-to-do but the theoretical bearing is perhaps clear enough and may require no further illustration especially as some detailed attention will be given to one of these lines of enterprise the establishments for the higher learning in another connection under the circumstances of the sheltered situation in which the leisure class is placed there seems therefore to be something of a reversion to the range of non-invidious impulses that characterizes the anti-predatory savage culture the reversion comprises both the sense of workmanship and the proclivity to indolence and good fellowship but in the modern scheme of life canons of conduct based on pecuniary or invidious merit stand in the way of a free exercise of these impulses and the dominant presence of these canons of conduct goes far to divert such efforts as are made on the basis of the non-invidious interest to the service of that invidious interest on which the pecuniary culture rests the canons of pecuniary decency are reducible for the present purpose to the principles of waste futility and ferocity the requirements of decency are imperiously present in meliorative enterprise as in other lines of conduct and exercise a selective surveillance over the details of conduct and management in any enterprise by guiding and adapting the method in detail these canons of decency go far to make all non-invidious aspiration or effort nugatory the pervasive impersonal uneager principle of futility is at hand from day to day and works obstructively to hinder the effectual expression of so much of the surviving anti-predatory aptitudes as is to be classed under the instinct of workmanship but its presence does not preclude the transmission of those aptitudes or the continued recurrence of an impulse to find expression for them end of second part of chapter thirteen section thirty four of the theory of the leisure class this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by eugene smith the theory of the leisure class by thorstein veblen third part of chapter thirteen survivals of the non-invidious interests 
in the later and farther development of the pecuniary culture the requirement of withdrawal from the industrial process in order to avoid social odium is carried so far as to comprise abstention from the emulative employments at this advanced stage the pecuniary culture negatively favors the assertion of the non-invidious propensities by relaxing the stress laid on the merit of emulative predatory or pecuniary occupations as compared with those of an industrial or productive kind as was noticed above the requirement of such withdrawal from all employment that is of human use applies more rigorously to the upper-class women than to any other class unless the priesthood of certain cults might be cited as an exception perhaps more apparent than real to this rule the reason for the more extreme insistence on a feudal life for this class of women than for the men of the same pecuniary and social grade lies in their being not only an upper grade leisure class but also at the same time a vicarious leisure class there is in their case a double ground for a consistent withdrawal from useful effort it has been well and repeatedly said by popular writers and speakers who reflect the common sense of intelligent people on questions of social structure and function that the position of woman in any community is the most striking index of the level of culture attained by the community and it might be added by any given class in the community this remark is perhaps truer as regards the stage of economic development than as regards development in any other respect at the same time the position assigned to the woman in the accepted scheme of life in any community or under any culture is in a very great degree an expression of traditions which have been shaped by the circumstances of an earlier phase of development and which have been but partially adapted to the existing economic circumstances or to the existing exigencies of temperament and habits of mind by which the women living under this modern economic situation are actuated the fact has already been remarked upon incidentally in the course of the discussion of the growth of economic institutions generally and in particular in speaking of vicarious leisure and of dress that the position of women in the modern economic scheme is more widely and more consistently at variance with the promptings of the instinct of workmanship than is the position of the men of the same classes it is also apparently true that the woman's temperament includes a larger share of this instinct that approves peace and disapproves futility it is therefore not a fortuitous circumstance that the women of modern industrial communities show a livelier sense of the discrepancy between the accepted scheme of life and the exigencies of the economic situation the several phases of the woman question have brought out in intelligible form the extent to which the life of women in modern society and in the polite circles especially is regulated by a body of common sense formulated under the economic circumstances of an earlier phase of development it is still felt that woman's life in its civil economic and social bearing is essentially and normally a vicarious life the merit or demerit of which is in the nature of thing to be imputed to some other individual who stands in some relation of ownership or tutelage to the woman so for instance any action on the part of a woman which traverses an injunction of the accepted schedule of proprieties is felt to reflect immediately upon the honor of the man whose woman she is there may of course be some sense of incongruity in the mind of any one passing an opinion of this kind on the woman's frailty or perversity but the common sense judgment of the community in such matters is after all delivered without much hesitation and few men would question the legitimacy of their sense of an outraged tutelage in any case that might arise on the other hand relatively little discredit attaches to a woman through the evil deeds of the man with whom her life is associated the good and beautiful scheme of life then that is to say the scheme to which we are habituated assigns to the woman a sphere ancillary to the activity of the man and it is felt that any departure from the traditions of her assigned round of duties is unwomanly 
if the question is as to civil rights or the suffrage, our common sense in the matter, that is to say the logical deliverance of our general scheme of life upon the point in question, says that the woman should be represented in the body politic and before the law, not immediately in her own person, but through the mediation of the head of the household to which she belongs. It is unfeminine in her to aspire to a self-directing, self-centered life, and our common sense tells us that her direct participation in the affairs of the community, civil or industrial, is a menace to that social order which expresses our habits of thought as they have been formed under the guidance of the traditions of the pecuniary culture. Quote, All this fume and froth of emancipating women from the slavery of man, and so on, is, to use the chaste and expressive language of Elizabeth Cady Stanton inversely, utter rot. The social relations of the sexes are fixed by nature. Our entire civilization, that is, whatever is good in it, is based on the home. End quote. The home is the household with a male head. This view, but commonly expressed even more chastely, is the prevailing view of the woman's status not only among the common run of men of civilized communities, but among the women as well. Women have a very alert sense of what the scheme of proprieties requires, and while it is true that many of them are ill at ease under the details which the code imposes, there are few who do not recognize that the existing moral order of necessity and by the divine right of prescription places the woman in a position ancillary to the man. In the last analysis, according to her own sense of what is good and beautiful, the woman's life is, and in theory must be, an expression of the man's life at the second remove. But in spite of this pervading sense of what is the good and natural place for the woman, there is also perceptible an incipient development of sentiment to the effect that this whole arrangement of tutelage and vicarious life and imputation of merit and demerit is somehow a mistake, or at least that even if it may be a natural growth and a good arrangement in its time and place, and in spite of its patent aesthetic value, still it does not adequately serve the more everyday ends of life in a modern industrial community. Even that large and substantial body of well-bred upper and middle class women to whose dispassionate, matronly sense of the traditional proprieties, this relation of status commends itself as fundamentally and eternally right. Even these, whose attitude is conservative, commonly find some slight discrepancy in detail between things as they are and things as they should be in this respect. But that less manageable body of modern women who, by force of youth, education, or temperament, are in some degree out of touch with the traditions of status received from the barbarian culture, and in whom there is, perhaps, an undue reversion to the impulse of self-expression and workmanship, these are touched with a sense of grievance, too vivid to leave them at rest. In this new woman movement, as these blind and incoherent efforts to rehabilitate the woman's preglacial standing have been named, there are at least two elements discernible, both of which are of an economic character. These two elements, or motives, are expressed by the double watchword emancipation and work. Each of these words is recognized to stand for something in the way of a widespread sense of grievance. The prevalence of the sentiment is recognized even by people who do not see that there is any real ground for a grievance in the situation as it stands today. It is among the women of the well-to-do classes, in the communities which are farthest advanced in industrial development, that this sense of a grievance to be redressed is most alive and finds most frequent expression. That is to say, in other words, there is a demand, more or less serious, for emancipation from all relation of status, tutelage, or vicarious life. And the revulsion asserts itself especially among the class of women upon whom the scheme of life, handed down from the regime of status, imposes with least litigation a vicarious life. And in those communities, whose economic development has departed farthest from the circumstances to which this traditional scheme is adapted, 
the demand comes from that portion of womankind which is excluded by the canons of good repute from all effectual work and which is closely reserved for a life of leisure and conspicuous consumption more than one critic of this new woman movement has misapprehended its motive the case of the american new woman has lately been summed up with some warmth by a popular observer of social phenomena Quote, she is petted by her husband the most devoted and hard-working of husbands in the world she is the superior of her husband in education and in almost every respect she is surrounded by the most numerous and delicate attentions yet she is not satisfied the anglo-saxon new woman is the most ridiculous production of modern times and destined to be the most ghastly failure of the century End quote. apart from the deprecation perhaps well placed which is contained in this presentment it adds nothing but obscurity to the woman question the grievance of the new woman is made up of those things which this typical characterization of the movement urges as reasons why she should be content she is petted and is permitted or even required to consume largely and conspicuously vicariously for her husband or other natural guardian she is exempted or debarred from vulgarly useful employment in order to perform leisure vicariously for the good repute of her natural pecuniary guardian these offices are the conventional marks of the unfree at the same time that they are incompatible with the human impulse to purposeful activity but the woman is endowed with her share which there is reason to believe is more than an even share of the instinct of workmanship to which futility of life or of expenditure is obnoxious she must unfold her life activity in response to the direct unmediated stimuli of the economic environment with which she is in contact the impulse is perhaps stronger upon the woman than upon the man to live her own life in her own way and to enter the industrial process of the community at something nearer than the second remove so long as the woman's place is consistently that of a drudge she is in the average of cases fairly contented with her lot she not only has something tangible and purposeful to do but she has also no time or thought to spare for a rebellious assertion of such human propensity to self-direction as she has inherited and after the stage of universal female drudgery has passed and a vicarious leisure without strenuous application becomes the accredited employment of the women of the well-to-do classes the prescriptive force of the canon of pecuniary decency which requires the observance of ceremonial futility on their part will long preserve high-minded women from any sentimental leaning to self-direction in a quote, sphere of usefulness end quote. This is especially true during the earlier phases of the pecuniary culture, while the leisure of the leisure class is still in great measure a predatory activity, an active assertion of mastery in which there is enough of tangible purpose of an invidious kind to admit of its being taken seriously as an employment to which one may without shame put one's hand. This condition of things has obviously lasted well down into the present in some communities, it continues to hold to a different extent for different individuals varying with the vividness of the sense of status and with the feebleness of the impulse to workmanship with which the individual is endowed but where the economic structure of the community has so far outgrown the scheme of life based on the status that the relation of personal subservience is no longer felt to be the sole natural human relation there the ancient habit of purposeful activity will begin to assert itself in the less conformable individuals against the more recent relatively superficial relatively ephemeral habits and views which the predatory and the pecuniary culture have contributed to our scheme of life these habits and views begin to lose their coercive force for the community or the class in question so soon as the habit of mind and the views of life due to the predatory and the quasi peaceable discipline cease to be in fairly close accord with the later developed economic situation this is evident in the case of the industrious classes of modern communities 
for them the leisure class scheme of life has lost much of its binding force especially as regards the element of status but it is also visibly being verified in the case of the upper classes though not in the same manner the habits derived from the predatory and quasi-peaceable culture are relatively ephemeral variants of certain underlying propensities and mental characteristics of the race, which it owes to the protracted discipline of the earlier proto-anthropoid cultural stage of peaceable, relatively undifferentiated economic life carried on in contact with a relatively simple and invariable material environment. When the habits superinduced by the emulative method of life have ceased to enjoy the section of existing economic exigencies a process of disintegration sets in whereby the habits of thought of more recent growth and of a less generic character to some extent yield the ground before the more ancient and more pervading spiritual characteristics of the race in a sense then the new woman movement marks a reversion to a more generic type of human character, or to a less differentiated expression of human nature. It is a type of human nature which is to be characterized as proto-anthropoid, and as regards the substance, if not the form, of its dominant traits, it belongs to a cultural stage that may be classed as possibly sub-human. The particular movement or evolutional feature in question of course shares this characterization with the rest of the later social development insofar as this social development shows evidence of a reversion to the spiritual attitude that characterizes the earlier undifferentiated stage of economic revolution such evidence of a general tendency to reversion from the dominance of the invidious interest is not entirely wanting although it is neither plentiful nor unquestionably convincing the general decay of the sense of status in modern industrial communities goes some way as evidence in this direction and the perceptible return to a disapproval of futility in human life and a disapproval of such activities as serve only the individual gain at the cost of the collectivity or at the cost of other social groups is evidence to a like effect there is a perceptible tendency to deprecate the infliction of pain as well as to discredit all marauding enterprises, even where these expressions of the invidious interest do not tangibly work to the material detriment of the community or of the individual who passes an opinion on them. It may even be said that in the modern industrial communities, the average dispassionate sense of men says that the ideal character is a character which makes for peace, goodwill, and economic efficiency rather than for a life of self-seeking force fraud and mastery the influence of the leisure class is not consistently for or against the rehabilitation of this proto-anthropoid human nature so far as concerns the chance of survival of individuals endowed with an exceptionally large share of the primitive traits the sheltered position of the class favors its members directly by withdrawing them from the pecuniary struggle. But indirectly, through the leisure class canons of conspicuous waste of goods and effort, the institution of a leisure class lessens the chance of survival of such individuals in the entire body of the population. The decent requirements of waste absorb the surplus energy of the population in an invidious struggle and leave no margin for the non-invidious expression of life. The remoter, less tangible, spiritual effects of the discipline of decency go in the same direction, and work perhaps more effectually to the same end. The canons of decent life are an elaboration of the principle of invidious comparison, and they accordingly act consistently to inhibit all non-invidious effort and to inculcate the self-regarding attitude. End of third part of chapter 13. Section 35 of The Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. Chapter 14. 
the higher learning as an expression of the pecuniary culture. To the end that suitable habits of thought on certain heads may be conversed in the incoming generation, a scholastic discipline is sanctioned by the common sense of the community and incorporated into the accredited scheme of life. The habits of thought which are so formed under the guidance of teachers and scholastic traditions have an economic value, a value as affecting the serviceability of the individual, no less real than the similar economic value of the habits of thought formed without such guidance under the discipline of everyday life. Whatever characteristics of the accredited scholastic scheme and discipline are traceable to the predilections of the leisure class or to the guidance of the canons of pecuniary merit are to be set down to the account of that institution, and whatever economic value these features of the educational scheme possess are the expression in detail of the value of that institution. It will be in place, therefore, to point out any peculiar features of the educational system which are traceable to the leisure class scheme of life, whether as regards the aim and method of the discipline, or as regards the compass and character of the body of knowledge inculcated. It is in learning proper, and more particularly in the higher learning, that the influence of leisure class ideals is most patent, and since the purpose here is not to make an exhaustive collation of data showing the effect of the pecuniary culture upon education, but rather to illustrate the method and trend of the leisure class influence in education, a survey of certain salient features of the higher learning, such as may serve this purpose, is all that will be attempted. In point of derivation and early development, learning is somewhat closely related to the devotional function of the community, particularly to the body of observances in which the service rendered the supernatural leisure class expresses itself. The service by which it is sought to conciliate supernatural agencies in the primitive cults is not an industrially profitable employment of the community's time and effort. It is, therefore, in great part, to be classed as a vicarious leisure performed for the supernatural powers with whom negotiations are carried on, and whose goodwill the service and the professions of subservience are conceived to procure. In great part, the early learning consisted in an acquisition of knowledge and facility in the service of a supernatural agent. It was therefore closely analogous in character to the training required for the domestic service of a temporal master. To a great extent, the knowledge acquired under the priestly teachers of the primitive community was knowledge of ritual and ceremonial, that is to say, a knowledge of the most proper, most effective, or most acceptable manner of approaching and observing the preternatural agents. What was learned was how to make oneself indispensable to these powers, and so to put oneself in a position to ask, or even to require, their intercession in the course of events, or their abstention from interference in any given enterprise. Propitiation was the end, and this end was sought, in great part, by acquiring facility and subservience. It appears to have been only gradually that other elements than those of efficient service of the master found their way into the stock of priestly or shamanistic instruction. The priestly servitor of the inscrutable powers that move in the external world came to stand in the position of a mediator between these powers and the common run of unrestricted humanity, for he was possessed of a knowledge of the supernatural etiquette which would admit him into the presence and as commonly happens with mediators between the vulgar and their masters, whether the masters be natural or preternatural, he found it expedient to have the means at hand tangibly to impress upon the vulgar the fact that these inscrutable powers would do what he might ask of them. Hence, presently, a knowledge of certain natural processes which could be turned to account for spectacular effect, together with some sleight of hand, came to be an integral part of priestly lore. Knowledge of this kind passes for knowledge of the unknowable, and it owes its serviceability for the sacerdotal purpose to its recondite character. It appears to have been from this source that learning, as an institution, arose, and its differentiation from this its parent stock of magic ritual and shamanistic fraud has been slow and tedious, and is scarcely yet complete even in the most advanced of the higher seminaries of learning. The recondite element in learning is still, as it has been in all ages, a very attractive and effective element for the purpose of impressing, or even imposing, upon the unlearned, and the standing of the savant in the mind of the altogether unlettered, is in great measure rated in terms of intimacy with the occult forces. So, for instance, as a typical case, even so late as the middle of this century, the Norwegian peasants 
have instinctively formulated their sense of the superior erudition of such doctors of divinity as luther Melanchthon, peter das and even so late a scholar in divinity as grundvig in terms of the black art these together with a very comprehensive list of minor celebrities both living and dead have been reputed masters in all magical arts and a high position in the ecclesiastical personnel has carried with it in the apprehension of these good people an implication of profound familiarity with magical practice and the occult sciences there is a parallel fact nearer home similarly going to show the close relationship in popular apprehension between erudition and the unknowable and it will at the same time serve to illustrate in somewhat coarse outline the bent which leisure class life gives to the cognitive interest while the belief is by no means confined to the leisure class that class to-day comprises a disproportionately large number of believers in occult sciences of all kinds and shades by those whose habits of thought are not shaped by contact with modern industry the knowledge of the unknowable is still felt to the ultimate if not the only true knowledge learning then set out by being in some sense a by-product of the priestly vicarious leisure class and at least until a recent date the higher learning has since remained in some sense a by-product or by occupation of the priestly classes as the body of systematized knowledge increased there presently arose a distinction traceable very far back in the history of education between esoteric and exoteric knowledge the former so far as there is a substantial difference between the two comprising such knowledge as is primarily of no economic or industrial effect and the latter comprising chiefly knowledge of industrial processes and of natural phenomena which were habitually turned to account for the material purposes of life this line of demarcation has in time become at least in popular apprehension the normal line between the higher learning and the lower it is significant not only as an evidence of their close affiliation with the priestly craft but also as indicating that their activity to a good extent falls under that category of conspicuous leisure known as manners and breeding that the learned class in all primitive communities are great sticklers for form precedent gradations of rank ritual ceremonial vestments and learned paraphernalia generally this is of course to be expected and it goes to say that the higher learning in its incipient phase is a leisure class occupation more specifically an occupation of the vicarious leisure class employed in the service of the supernatural leisure class but this predilection for the paraphernalia of learning goes also to indicate a further point of contact or of continuity between the priestly office and the office of the savant in point of derivation learning as well as the priestly office is largely an outgrowth of sympathetic magic and this magical apparatus of form and ritual therefore finds its place with the learned class of the primitive community as a matter of course the ritual and paraphernalia have an occult efficacy for the magical purpose so that their presence as an integral factor in the earlier phases of the development of magic and science is a matter of expediency quite as much as of affectionate regard for symbolism simply this sense of the efficacy of symbolic ritual and of sympathetic effect to be wrought through dexterous rehearsal of the traditional accessories of the act or end to be compassed is of course present more obviously and in larger measure in magical practice than in the discipline of the sciences even of the occult sciences but there are i apprehend few persons with a cultivated sense of scholastic merit to whom the ritualistic accessories of science are altogether an idle matter the very great tenacity with which these ritualistic paraphernalia persist through the later course of the development is evident to any one who will reflect on what has been the history of learning in our civilization even to-day there are such things in the usage of the learned community as the cap and gown matriculation initiation and graduation ceremonies and the conferring of scholastic degrees dignities and prerogatives in a way which suggests some sort of scholarly apostolic succession the usage of the priestly orders is no doubt the proximate source of all these features of learned ritual vestments sacramental initiation the transmission of peculiar dignities and virtues by the imposition of hands and the like but their derivation is traceable back to this point to the source from which the specialized priestly class proper came to be distinguished from the sorcerer on the one hand and from the menial servant of a temporal master on the other hand 
so far as regards both their derivation and their psychological content, these usages and the conceptions on which they rest belong to a stage in cultural development no later than that of the Angakok and the Rainmaker. Their place in the later phases of devout observance, as well in the higher educational system, is that of a survival from a very early animistic phase of the development of human nature. These ritualistic features of the educational system of the present and of the recent past, it is quite safe to say, have their place primarily in the higher, liberal, and classic institutions and grades of learning, rather than in the lower, technological, or practical grades and branches of the system. So far as they possess them, the lower and less reputable branches of the educational scheme have evidently borrowed these things from the higher grades, and their continued persistence among the practical schools, without the sanction of the continued example of the higher and classic grades, would be highly improbable, to say the least. With the lower and practical schools and scholars, the adoption and cultivation of these usages is a case of mimicry, due to a desire to conform, as far as may be, to the standards of the scholastic reputability maintained by the upper grades and classes, who have come by these accessory features legitimately by the right of lineal devolution. The analysis may even be safely carried a step farther. Ritualistic survivals and reversions come out in fullest vigor and with the freest air of spontaneity among those seminaries of learning which have to do primarily with the education of the priestly and leisure classes. Accordingly, it should appear, and it does pretty plainly appear, on a survey of recent developments in college and university life, that wherever schools founded for the instruction of the lower classes in the immediately useful branches of knowledge grow into institutions of the higher learning, the growth of ritualistic ceremonial and paraphernalia and of elaborate scholastic functions goes hand in hand with the transition of the schools in question from the field of homely practicality into the higher classical sphere. The initial purpose of these schools, and the work with which they have chiefly had to do at the earlier of these two stages of their evolution, has been that of fitting the young of the industrious classes for work. On the higher, classical plane of learning, to which they commonly tend, their dominant aim becomes the preparation of the youth of the priestly and the leisure classes, or of an incipient leisure class, for the consumption of goods, material and immaterial, according to a conventionally accepted, reputable scope and method. This happy issue has commonly been the fate of schools founded by friends of the people for the aid of struggling young men, and where this transition is made in good form, there is commonly, if not invariably, a coincident change to a more ritualistic life in the schools. In the school life of today, learned ritual is in a general way best at home in schools whose chief end is the cultivation of the humanities. This correlation is shown, perhaps more neatly than anywhere else, in the life history of the American colleges and universities of recent growth. There may be many exceptions from the rule, especially among those schools which have been founded by the typically reputable and ritualistic churches, and which, therefore, started on the conservative and classical plane, or reached the classical position by a shortcut. But the general rule as regards the colleges founded in the newer American communities during the present century has been that so long as the constituency from which the colleges have drawn their pupils has been dominated by habits of industry and thrift, so long the reminiscences of the medicine man have found but a scant and precarious acceptance in the scheme of college life. But so soon as wealth begins appreciably to accumulate in the community, and so soon as a given school begins to lean on a leisure class constituency, there comes also a perceptibly increased insistence on scholastic ritual and on conformity to the ancient forms as regards vestments and social and scholastic solemnities. So, for instance, there has been an approximate coincidence between the growth of wealth among the constituency which supports any given college of the Middle West and the date of acceptance, first into tolerance and then into imperative vogue, of evening dress for men and of the décolleté for women, as the scholarly vestments proper to occasions of learned solemnity or to the seasons of social amenity within the college circle. Apart from the mechanical difficulty of so large a task, it would scarcely be a difficult matter to trace this correlation. The like is true of the vogue of the cap and gown. Cap and gown have been adopted as learned insignia by many colleges of this section within the last few years, and it is safe to say that this could scarcely have occurred at a much earlier date, 
or until there had grown up a leisure class sentiment of sufficient volume in the community to support a strong movement of reversion towards an archaic view as to the legitimate end of education this particular item of learned ritual it may be noted would not only commend itself to the leisure class sense of the fitness of things as appealing to the archaic propensity for spectacular effect and the predilection for antique symbolism but it at the same time fits into the leisure class scheme of life as involving a notable element of conspicuous waste the precise date at which the reversion to cap and gown took place as well as the fact that it affected so large a number of schools at about the same time seems to have been due in some measure to a wave of atavistic sense of conformity and reputability that passed over the community at that period end of the first part of chapter fourteen Section 36 of The Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. Second part of Chapter 14. The Higher Learning as an Expression of the Pecuniary Culture. It may not be entirely beside the point to note that in point of time, this curious reversion seems to coincide with the culmination of a certain vogue of atavistic sentiment and tradition in other directions also. The wave of reversion seems to have received its initial impulse in the psychologically disintegrating effects of the Civil War. Habituation to war entails a body of predatory habits of thought, whereby clannishness in some measure replaces the sense of solidarity, and a sense of invidious distinction supplants the impulse to equitable everyday serviceability as an outcome of the cumulative action of these factors the generation which follows a season of war is apt to witness a rehabilitation of the element of status both in its social life and in its scheme of devout observances and other symbolic or ceremonial forms throughout the eighties and less plainly traceable through the seventies also there was perceptible a gradually advancing wave of sentiment favoring quasi-predatory business habits, insistence on status, anthropomorphism, and conservatism generally. The more direct and unmediated of these expressions of the barbarian temperament, such as the recrudescence of outlawry and the spectacular quasi-predatory careers of fraud run by certain captains of industry, came to a head earlier and were appreciably on the decline by the close of the seventies. The recrudescence of anthropomorphic sentiment also seems to have passed its most acute stage before the close of the eighties but the learned ritual and paraphernalia here spoken of are a still remoter and more recondite expression of the barbarian animistic sense and these therefore gained vogue and elaboration more slowly and reached their most effective development at a still later date there is reason to believe that the culmination is now already past except for the new impetus given by a new war experience and except for the support which the growth of a wealthy class affords to all ritual and especially to whatever ceremonial is wasteful and pointedly suggests gradations of status it is probable that the late improvements and augmentation of scholastic insignia and ceremonial would gradually decline but while it may be true that the cap and gown and the more strenuous observance of scholastic proprieties which came with them were floated in on this post-bellum tidal wave of reversion to barbarism it is also no doubt true that such a ritualistic reversion could not have been effected in the college scheme of life until the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a property class had gone far enough to afford the requisite pecuniary ground for a movement which should bring the colleges of the country up to the leisure class requirements in the higher learning the adoption of the cap and gown is one of the striking atavistic features of modern college life and at the same time it marks the fact that these colleges have definitely become leisure class establishments either in actual achievement or in aspiration as further evidence of the close relation between the educational system and the cultural standards of the community it may be remarked that there is some tendency latterly to substitute the captain of industry in place of the priest as the head of seminaries of the higher learning the substitution is by no means complete or unequivocal those heads of institutions are best accepted who combine the sacerdotal office with a high degree of pecuniary efficiency 
there is a similar but less pronounced tendency to entrust the work of instruction in the higher learning to men of some pecuniary qualification administrative ability and skill in advertising the enterprise count for rather more than they once did as qualifications for the work of teaching this applies especially in those sciences that have most to do with the everyday facts of life and it is particularly true of schools in the economically single-minded communities this partial substitution of pecuniary for sacerdotal efficiency is a concomitant of the modern transition from conspicuous leisure to conspicuous consumption as the chief means of reputability the correlation of the two facts is probably clear without further elaboration the attitude of the schools and of the learned class towards the education of women serves to show in what manner and to what extent learning has departed from its ancient station of priestly and leisure class prerogatives and it indicates also what approach has been made by the truly learned to the modern economic or industrial matter-of-fact standpoint the higher schools and the learned professions were until recently taboo to the women these establishments were from the outset and have in great measure continued to be devoted to the education of the priestly and leisure classes the women as has been shown elsewhere were the original subservient class and to some extent especially so far as regards their nominal or ceremonial position they have remained in that relation down to the present there has prevailed a strong sense that the admission of women to the privileges of the higher learning as to the illusion in mysteries would be derogatory to the dignity of the learned craft it is therefore only very recently and almost solely in the industrially most advanced communities that the higher grades of schools have been freely opened to women and even under the urgent circumstances prevailing in the modern industrial communities the highest and most reputable universities show an extreme reluctance in making the move the sense of class worthiness that is to say of status of an honorific differentiation of the sexes according to a distinction between superior and inferior intellectual dignity survives in a vigorous form in these corporations of the aristocracy of learning it is felt that the woman should in all propriety acquire only such knowledge as may be classed under one or the other of two heads one such knowledge as conduces immediately to a better performance of domestic service the domestic sphere two such accomplishments and dexterity quasi scholarly and quasi artistic as plainly come in under the head of a performance of vicarious leisure knowledge is felt to be unfeminine if it is knowledge which expresses the unfolding of the learner's own life the acquisition of which proceeds on the learner's own cognitive interest without prompting from the canons of propriety and without reference back to a master whose comfort or good repute is to be enhanced by the employment or the exhibition of it so also all knowledge which is useful as evidence of leisure other than vicarious leisure is scarcely feminine for an appreciation of the relation which these higher seminaries of learning bear to the economic life of the community the phenomena which have been reviewed are of importance rather as indications of a general attitude than as being in themselves facts of first-rate economic consequence they go to show what is the instinctive attitude and animus of the learned class towards the life process of an industrial community they serve as an exponent of the stage of development for the industrial purpose attained by the higher learning and by the learned class and so they afford an indication as to what may fairly be looked for from this class at points where the learning and the life of the class bear more immediately upon the economic life and efficiency of the community and upon the adjustment of its scheme of life to the requirements of the time what these ritualistic survivals go to indicate is a prevalence of conservatism if not of reactionary sentiment especially among the higher schools where the conventional learning is cultivated to these indications of a conservative attitude is to be added another characteristic which goes in the same direction but which is a symptom of graver consequence than this playful inclination to trivialities of form and ritual by far the greater number of american colleges and universities for instance are affiliated to some religious denomination and are somewhat given to devout observances their putative familiarity with scientific methods and the scientific point of view should presumably exempt the faculties of these schools from animistic habits of thought but there is still a considerable proportion of them who profess an attachment to the anthropomorphic beliefs and observances of an earlier culture 
these professions of devotional zeal are no doubt to a good extent expedient and perfunctory both on the part of the schools in their corporate capacity and on the part of the individual members of the corps of instructors but it cannot be doubted that there is after all a very appreciable element of anthropomorphic sentiment present in the higher schools so far as this is the case it must be set down as the expression of an archaic animistic habit of mind this habit of mind must necessarily assert itself to some extent in the instruction offered and to this extent its influence in shaping the habits of thought of the student makes for conservatism and reversion it acts to hinder his development in the direction of matter-of-fact knowledge such as best serves the ends of industry the college sports which have so great a vogue in the reputable seminaries of learning today tend in a similar direction and indeed sports have much in common with the devout attitude of the colleges both as regards their psychological basis and as regards their disciplinary effect but this expression of the barbarian temperament is to be credited primarily to the body of students rather than to the temper of the schools as such except in so far as the college or the college officials as sometimes happens actively countenance and foster the growth of sports the like is true of college fraternities as of college sports but with a difference the latter are chiefly an expression of the predatory impulse simply the former are more specifically an expression of that heritage of clannishness which is so large a feature in the temperament of the predatory barbarian it is also noticeable that a close relation subsists between the fraternities and the sporting activity of the schools after what has already been said in an earlier chapter on the sporting and gambling habit it is scarcely necessary further to discuss the economic value of this training in sports and in factional organization and activity but all these features of the scheme of life of the learned class and of the establishments dedicated to the conservation of the higher learning are in a great measure incidental only they are scarcely to be accounted organic elements of the professed work of research and instruction for the ostensible pursuit of which the school exists but these symptomatic indications go to establish a presumption as to the character of the work performed as seen from the economic point of view and as to the bent which the serious work carried on under their auspices gives to the youth who resort to the schools the presumption raised by the considerations already offered is that in their work also as well as in their ceremonial the higher schools may be expected to take a conservative position but this presumption must be checked by a comparison of the economic character of the work actually performed and by something of a survey of the learning whose conservation is entrusted to the higher schools on this head it is well known that the accredited seminaries of learning have until a recent date held a conservative position they have taken an attitude of depreciation towards all innovations as a general rule a new point of view or a new formulation of knowledge have been countenanced and taken up within the schools only after these new things have made their way outside of the schools as exceptions from this rule are chiefly to be mentioned innovations of an inconspicuous kind and departures which do not bear in any tangible way upon the conventional point of view or upon the conventional scheme of life as for instance details of fact in the mathematico-physical sciences and new readings and interpretations of the classics especially such as have a philological or literary bearing only except within the domain of the humanities in the narrow sense and except so far as the traditional point of view of the humanities has been left intact by the innovators it has generally held true that the accredited learned class and the seminaries of the higher learning have looked askance at all innovation new views new departures in scientific theory especially in new departures which touch the theory of human relations at any point have found a place in the scheme of the university tardily and by a reluctant tolerance rather than by a cordial welcome and the men who have occupied themselves with such efforts to widen the scope of human knowledge have not commonly been well received by their learned contemporaries the higher schools have not commonly given their countenance to a serious advance in the methods or the content of knowledge until the innovations have outlived their youth and much of their usefulness after they have become commonplaces of the intellectual furniture of a new generation which has grown up under and has had its habits of thought shaped by the new extra-scholastic body of knowledge 
and the new standpoint. This is true of the recent past. How far it may be true of the immediate present, it would be hazardous to say, for it is impossible to see present-day facts in such perspective as to get a fair conception of their relative proportions. So far nothing has been said of the Messinus function of the well-to-do, which is habitually dwelt on at some length by writers and speakers who treat of the development of culture and of social structure. This leisure class function is not without an important bearing on the higher and on the spread of knowledge and culture. The manner and the degree in which the class furthers learning through patronage of this kind is sufficiently familiar. It has been frequently presented in affectionate and effective terms by spokesmen whose familiarity with the topic fits them to bring home to their hearers the profound significance of this cultural factor. These spokesmen, however, have presented the matter from the point of view of the cultural interest, or of the interest of reputability, rather than from that of the economic interest. As apprehended from the economic point of view, and valued for the purpose of industrial serviceability, this function of the well-to-do, as well as the intellectual attitude of members of the well-to-do class, merits some attention, and will bear illustration. End of second part of chapter 14. Section 37 of The Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. Third part of Chapter 14 The Higher Learning as an Expression of the Pecuniary Culture. By way of characterization of the Messinus relation, it is to be noted that, considered externally, as an economic or industrial relation simply, it is a relation of status. The scholar under the patronage performs the duties of a learned life vicariously for his patron, to whom a certain repute inures after the manner of the good repute imputed to a master for whom any form of vicarious leisure is performed. It is also to be noted that, in point of historical fact, the furtherance of learning, or the maintenance of scholarly activity through the Messinus relation, has most commonly been a furtherance of proficiency in classical lore or in the humanities. The knowledge tends to lower, rather than to heighten, the industrial efficiency of the community. Further, as regards the direct participation of the members of the leisure class in the furtherance of knowledge, the canons of reputable living act to throw such intellectual interest as seeks expression among the class on the side of classical and formal erudition, rather than on the side of the sciences that bear some relation to the community's industrial life. The most frequent excursions into other than classical fields of knowledge, on the part of members of the leisure class, are made into the discipline of law and the political, and more especially the administrative sciences. These so-called sciences are substantially bodies of maxims of expediency for guidance in the leisure class office of government as conducted on a proprietary basis. The interest with which this discipline is approached is therefore not commonly the intellectual or cognitive interest simply. It is largely the practical interest of the exigencies of that relation of mastery in which the members of the class are placed. In point of derivation, the office of government is a predatory function, pertaining integrally to the archaic leisure class scheme of life. It is an exercise of control and coercion over the population from which the class draws its sustenance. This discipline, as well as the incidents of practice which give it its content, therefore has some attraction for the class apart from all questions of cognition. All this holds true wherever and so long as the governmental office continues, in form or in substance, to be a proprietary office, and it holds true beyond that limit in so far as the tradition of the more archaic phase of governmental evolution has lasted on into the later life of those modern communities for whom proprietary government by a leisure class is now beginning to pass away. For that field of learning within which the cognitive or intellectual interest is dominant, the sciences properly so called, the case is somewhat different, not only as regards the attitude of the leisure class, but as regards the whole drift of the pecuniary culture. Knowledge for its own sake, the exercise of the faculty of comprehensive without ulterior purpose, should, it might be expected, be sought by men whom no urgent material interest diverts from such a quest. 
the sheltered industrial position of the leisure class should give free play to the cognitive interest in members of this class and we should consequently have as many writers confidently find that we do have a very large proportion of scholars scientists savants derived from this class and deriving their incentive to scientific investigation and speculation from the discipline of a life of leisure some such result is to be looked for but there are features of the leisure class scheme of life already sufficiently dwelt upon which go to divert the intellectual interest of this class to other subjects than that causal sequence in phenomena that makes the content of the sciences the habits of thought which characterize the life of the class run on the personal relation of dominance and on the derivative invidious concepts of honor worth merit character and the like the causal sequence which makes up the subject matter of science is not visible from this point of view neither does good repute attach to knowledge of facts which are vulgarly used hence it should appear probable that the interest of the invidious comparison with respect to pecuniary or other honorific merit should occupy the attention of the leisure class to the neglect of the cognitive interest where this latter interest asserts itself it should commonly be diverted to fields of speculation or investigation which are reputable and futile rather than to the quest of scientific knowledge such indeed has been the history of priestly and leisure class learning so long as no considerable body of systematized knowledge has been intruded into the scholastic discipline from an extra-scholastic source but since the relation of mastery and subservience is ceasing to be the dominant and formative factor in the community's life process other features of the life process and other points of view are forcing themselves upon the scholars the true-bred gentleman of leisure should and does see the world from the point of view of the personal relation and the cognitive interest so far as it asserts itself in him should seek to systematize phenomena on this basis such indeed is the case with the gentlemen of the old school in whom the leisure class ideals have suffered no disintegration and such is the attitude of his latter-day descendant in so far as he has fallen heir to the full complement of upper-class virtues but the ways of heredity are devious and not every gentleman's son is to the manner born especially is the transmission of the habits of thought which characterize the predatory master somewhat precarious in the case of a line of descent in which but one or two of the latest steps have lain within the leisure class discipline the chances of occurrence of a strong congenital or acquired bent toward the exercise of the cognitive aptitudes are apparently best in those members of the leisure class who are of lower class or middle class antecedents that is to say those who have inherited the complement of aptitudes proper to the industrious classes and who owe their place in the leisure class to the possession of qualities which count for more today than they did in the times when the leisure class scheme of life took shape but even outside the range of these later accessions to the leisure class there are an appreciable number of individuals in whom the invidious interest is not sufficiently dominant to shape their theoretical views and in whom the proclivity to theory is sufficiently strong to lead them into the scientific quest the higher learning owes the intrusion of the sciences in part to these aberrant scions of the leisure class who have come under the dominant influence of the latter-day tradition of impersonal relation and who have inherited a complement of human aptitudes differing in certain salient features from the temperament which is characteristic of the regime of status but it owes the presence of this alien body of scientific knowledge also in part and in a higher degree to members of the industrious classes who have been in sufficiently easy circumstances to turn their attention to other interests than that of finding daily sustenance and whose inherited aptitudes and anthropomorphic point of view does not dominate their intellectual processes as between these two groups which approximately comprise the effective force of scientific progress it is the latter that has contributed the most and with respect to both it seems to be true that they are not so much the source as the vehicle or at the most they are the instrument of commutation by which the habits of thought enforced upon the community through contact with its environment under the exigencies of modern associated life and the mechanical industries are turned to account for theoretical knowledge science in the sense of an articulate recognition of causal sequence in phenomena whether physical or social has been a feature of the western culture only since the industrial process in the western communities has come to be substantially a process of mechanical contrivances 
in which man's office is that of discrimination and valuation of material forces science has flourished somewhat in the same degree as the industrial life of the community has conformed to this pattern and somewhat in the same degree as the industrial interest has dominated the community's life and science and scientific theory especially has made headway in the several departments of human life and knowledge in proportion as each of these several departments has successively come into closer contact with the industrial processes and the economic interest or perhaps it is truer to say in proportion as each of them has successively escaped from the dominance of the conceptions of personal relation or status and of the derivative canons of anthropomorphic fitness and honorific worth it is only as the exigencies of modern industrial life have enforced the recognition of causal sequence in the practical contact of mankind with their environment that men have come to systematize the phenomena of this environment and the facts of their own contact with it in terms of causal sequence so that while the higher learning in its best development as the perfect flower of scholasticism and classicism was a by-product of the priestly office and the life of leisure so modern science may be said to be a by-product of the industrial process through these groups of men then investigators savants scientists inventors speculators most of whom have done their most telling work outside of the shelter of the schools the habits of thought enforced by the modern industrial life have found coherent expression and elaboration as a body of theoretical science having to do with the causal sequence of phenomena and from this extra-scholastic field of scientific speculation changes of method and purpose have from time to time been intruded into the scholastic discipline in this connection it is to be remarked that there is a very perceptible difference of substance and purpose between the instruction offered in the primary and secondary schools on the one hand and in the higher seminaries of learning on the other hand the difference in point of immediate practicality of the information imparted and of the proficiency acquired may be of some consequence and may merit the attention which it has from time to time received but there is more substantial difference in the mental and spiritual bent which is favored by the one and the other discipline this divergent trend in discipline between the higher and lower learning is especially noticeable as regards the primary education in its latest development in the advanced industrial communities here the instruction is directed chiefly to proficiency or dexterity intellectual and manual in the apprehension and employment of impersonal facts in their causal rather than their honorific incidents it is true under the traditions of the earlier days when the primary education was also predominantly a leisure class commodity a free use is still made of emulation as a spur to diligence in the common run of primary schools but even this use of emulation as an expedient is visibly declining in the primary grades of instruction in communities where the lower education is not under the guidance of the ecclesiastical or military tradition all this holds true in a peculiar degree and more especially on the spiritual side of such portions of the educational system as have been immediately affected by kindergarten methods and ideals the peculiarly non-invidious trend of the kindergarten discipline and the similar character of the kindergarten influence in primary education beyond the limits of the kindergarten proper should be taken in connection with what has already been said of the peculiar spiritual attitude of leisure class womankind under the circumstances of the modern economic situation the kindergarten discipline is at its best or at its farthest removed from ancient patriarchal and pedagogical ideas in the advanced industrial communities where there is a considerable body of intelligent and idle women and where the system of status has somewhat abated in rigor under the disintegrating influence of industrial life and in the absence of a consistent body of military and ecclesiastical traditions it is from these women in easy circumstances that it gets its moral support the aims and methods of the kindergarten commend themselves with a special effect to this class of women who are ill at ease under the pecuniary code of reputable life the kindergarten and whatever the kindergarten spirit counts for in modern education therefore is to be set down along with the new woman movement to the account of that revulsion against futility and invidious comparison which the leisure class life under modern circumstances induces in the women most immediately exposed to its discipline in this way it appears that by indirection the institution of a leisure class here again favors the growth of a non-invidious attitude 
which may, in the long run, prove a menace to the stability of the institution itself, and even to the institution of individual ownership on which it rests. During the recent past, some tangible changes have taken place in the scope of college and university teaching. These changes have, in the main, consisted in a partial displacement of the humanities, those branches of learning which are conceived to make for the traditional culture, character, tastes, and ideals, by those more matter-of-fact branches, which make for civic and industrial efficiency. To put the same thing in other words, those branches of knowledge which make for efficiency, ultimately productive efficiency, have gradually been gaining ground against those branches which make for a heightened consumption or a lowered industrial efficiency, and for a type of character suited to the regime of status. In this adaptation of the scheme of instruction, the higher schools have commonly been found on the conservative side. Each step which they have taken in advance has been, to some extent, of the nature of a concession. The sciences have been intruded into the scholar's discipline from without, not to say from below. It is noticeable that the humanities which have so reluctantly yielded ground to the sciences are pretty uniformly adapted to shape the character of the student in accordance with a traditional self-centered scheme of consumption, a scheme of contemplation and enjoyment of the true, the beautiful, and the good, according to a conventional standard of propriety and excellence, the salient feature of which is leisure, optium cum dignitati. In language, veiled by their own habituation to the archaic, decorous point of view, the spokesmen of the humanities have insisted upon the ideal embodied in the maxim, frugis consumere nati. This attitude should occasion no surprise in the case of schools which are shaped by and rest upon a leisure class culture. The professed grounds on which it has been sought, as far as might be, to maintain the received standards and methods of culture intact, are likewise characteristic of the archaic temperament and of the leisure class theory of life. The enjoyment and the bent derived from habitual contemplation of the life, ideals, speculations, and methods of consuming time and goods, in vogue among the leisure class of classical antiquity, for instance, is felt to be higher, nobler, worthier, than what results in these respects from a like familiarity with the everyday life and the knowledge and aspirations of commonplace humanity in a modern community that learning the content of which is an unmitigated knowledge of latter-day men and things is by comparison lower base ignoble one even hears the epithet subhuman applied to this matter-of-fact knowledge of mankind and of everyday life end of third part of chapter fourteen Section 38 of The Theory of the Leisure Class. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. Fourth part of Chapter 14, The Higher Learning as an Expression of the Pecuniary Culture. This contention of the leisure class spokesman of the humanities seems to be substantially sound, in point of substantial fact, the gratification and the culture, or the spiritual attitude or habit of mind, resulting from an habitual contemplation of the anthropomorphism, clannishness, and leisurely self-complacency of the gentleman of an early day, or from a familiarity with the animistic superstitions and the exuberant truculence of the Homeric heroes, for instance, is aesthetically considered more legitimate than the corresponding results derived from a matter-of-fact knowledge of things and a contemplation of latter-day civic or workmanlike efficiency. There can be but little question that the first-named habits have the advantage in respect of aesthetic or honorific value, and therefore in respect of the worth which is made the basis of award in the comparison. The content of the canons of taste, and more particularly of the canons of honor, is in the nature of things a resultant of the past life and circumstances of the race, transmitted to the later generation by inheritance or by tradition, and the fact that the protracted dominance of a predatory leisure-class scheme of life has profoundly shaped the habit of mind and the point of view of the race in the past, is a sufficient basis for an aesthetically legitimate dominance of such a theme of life in very much of what concerns matters of taste in the present. For the purpose in hand, canons of taste are race habits, acquired through a more or less protracted habituation to the approval or disapproval of the kind of things upon which a favorable or unfavorable judgment of taste is passed. 
Other things being equal, the longer and more unbroken the habituation, the more legitimate is the canon of taste in question. All this seems to be even truer of judgments regarding worth or honor than of judgments of taste generally. But whatever may be the aesthetic legitimacy of the derogatory judgment passed on the newer learning by the spokesman of the humanities, and however substantial may be the merits of the contention that the classic lore is worthier and results in a more truly human culture and character, it does not concern the question in hand. The question in hand is as to how far these branches of learning, and the point of view for which they stand in the educational system, help or hinder an efficient collective life under modern industrial circumstances, how far they further a more facile adaptation to the economic situation of today. The question is an economic, not an aesthetic one, and the leisure class standards of learning, which find expression in the deprecatory attitude of the higher schools toward matter-of-fact knowledge, are, for the present purpose, to be valued from this point of view only. For this purpose, the use of such epithets as noble, base, higher, lower, etc., is significant only as showing the animus and the point of view of the disputants, whether they contend for the worthiness of the new or of the old. All these epithets are honorific or humilific terms, that is to say, they are terms of invidious comparison, which, in the last analysis, fall under the category of the reputable or the disreputable, that is, they belong within the range of ideas that characterizes the scheme of life of the regime of status. That is, they are in substance an expression of sportsmanship, of the predatory and animistic habit of mind. That is, they indicate an archaic point of view and theory of life, which may fit the predatory stage of culture and of economic organization from which they have sprung, but which are, from the point of view of economic efficiency in the broader sense, to serviceable anachronisms. The classics and their position of prerogative in the scheme of education to which the higher seminaries of learning cling with such a fond predilection serve to shape the intellectual attitude and lower the economic efficiency of the new learned generation. They do this not only by holding up an archaic ideal of manhood, but also by the discrimination which they inculcate with respect to the reputable and the disreputable in knowledge. This result is accomplished in two ways. One, by inspiring an habitual aversion to what is merely useful, as contrasted with what is merely honorific in learning, and so shaping the tastes of the novice that he comes in good faith to find gratification of his taste solely, or almost solely, in such exercise of the intellect as normally results in no industrial or social gain. And two, by consuming the learner's time and effort in acquiring knowledge which is of no use except in so far as this learning has by convention become incorporated into the sum of learning required of the scholar, and has thereby affected the terminology and diction employed in the useful branches of knowledge. Except for this terminological difficulty, which is itself a consequence of the vogue of the classics of the past, a knowledge of the ancient languages, for instance, would have no practical bearing for any scientist or any scholar not engaged on work primarily of a linguistic character. Of course, all this has nothing to say as to the cultural value of the classics, nor is there any intention to disparage the discipline of the classics or the bent which their study gives to the student. That bent seems to be of an economically disserviceable kind, but this fact, somewhat notorious indeed, need disturb no one who has the good fortune to find comfort and strength in the classical lore. The fact that classical learning acts to derange the learner's workmanlike attitudes should fall lightly upon the apprehension of those who hold workmanship of small account in comparison with the cultivation of decorous ideals. Yon fides e pax e honos por dorque, priscus e neglecta redire virtus odet. Owing to the circumstance that this knowledge has become part of the elementary requirements in our system of education, the ability to use and to understand certain of the dead languages of southern Europe is not only gratifying to the person who finds occasion to parade his accomplishments in this respect, but the evidence of such knowledge serves at the same time to recommend any savant to his audience, both lay and learned. It is currently expected that a certain number of years shall have been spent in acquiring this substantially useless information, and its absence creates a presumption of hasty and precarious learning, as well as of a vulgar practicality that is equally obnoxious to the conventional standards of sound scholarship and intellectual force. The case is analogous to what happens in the purchase of any article of consumption by a purchaser who is not an expert judge of materials or of workmanship. 
he makes his estimate of value of the article chiefly on the ground of the apparent expensiveness of the finish of those decorative parts and features which have no immediate relation to the intrinsic usefulness of the article the presumption being that some sort of ill-defined proportion subsists between the substantial value of an article and the expense of adornment added in order to sell it the presumption that there can ordinarily be no sound scholarship where a knowledge of the classics and humanities is wanting leads to a conspicuous waste of time and labor on the part of the general body of students in acquiring such knowledge the conventional insistence on a modicum of conspicuous waste as an incident of all reputable scholarship has affected our canons of taste and of serviceability in matters of scholarship in much the same way as the same principle has influenced our judgment of the serviceability of manufactured goods it is true since conspicuous consumption has gained more and more on conspicuous leisure as a means of repute the acquisition of the dead languages is no longer so imperative a requirement as it once was and its talismanic virtue as a voucher of scholarship has suffered a concomitant impairment but while this is true it is also true that the classics have scarcely lost in absolute value as a voucher of scholastic respectability since for this purpose it is only necessary that the scholar should be able to put in evidence some learning which is conventionally recognized as evidence of wasted time and the classics lend themselves with great facility to this use indeed there can be little doubt that it is their utility as evidence of wasted time and effort and hence of the pecuniary strength necessary in order to afford this waste that has secured to the classics their position of prerogative in the scheme of higher learning and has led to their being esteemed the most honorific of all learning they serve the decorative ends of leisure class learning better than any other body of knowledge and hence they are an effective means of reputability in this respect the classics have until lately had scarcely a rival they still have no dangerous rival on the continent of europe but lately since college athletics have won their way into a recognized standing as an accredited field of scholarly accomplishment this latter branch of learning if athletics may be freely classed as learning has become a rival of the classics for the primacy in leisure class education in american and english schools athletics have an obvious advantage over the classics for the purpose of leisure class learning since success as an athlete presumes not only waste of time but also waste of money as well as the possession of certain highly unindustrial archaic traits of character and temperament in the german universities the place of athletics and greek letter fraternities as a leisure class scholarly occupation has in some measure been supplied by a skilled and graded inebriety and a perfunctory dueling the leisure class and its standard of virtue archaism and waste can scarcely have been concerned in the introduction of the classics into the scheme of the higher learning but the tenacious retention of the classics by the higher schools and the high degree of reputability which still attaches to them are no doubt due to their conforming so closely to the requirements of archaism and waste classic always carries this connotation of wasteful and archaic whether it is used to denote the dead languages or the obsolete or obsolescent forms of thought and diction in the living language or to denote other items of scholarly activity or apparatus to which it is applied with less aptness so the archaic idiom of the english language is spoken of as classic english its use is imperative in all speaking and writing upon serious topics and a facile use of it lends dignity to even the most commonplace and trivial string of talk the newest form of english diction is of course never written the sense of that leisure class propriety which requires archaism in speech is present even in the most illiterate or sensational writers in sufficient force to prevent such a lapse on the other hand the highest and most conventionalized style of archaic diction is quite characteristically properly employed only in communications between an anthropomorphic divinity and his subjects midway between these extremes lies the everyday speech of leisure class conversation and literature elegant diction whether in writing or speaking is an effective means of reputability it is of moment to know with some precision what is the degree of archaism conventionally required in speaking on any given topic usage differs appreciably from the pulpit to the marketplace the latter as might be expected admits the use of relatively new and effective words and turns of expression even by fastidious persons a discriminative avoidance of neologisms is honorific not only because it argues that time has been wasted in acquiring the obsolescent habit of speech but also as showing that the speaker has from infancy 
habitually associated with persons who have been familiar with the obsolescent idiom. It thereby goes to show his leisure class antecedents. Great purity of speech is presumptive evidence of several lives spent in other than vulgarly useful occupations, although its evidence is by no means entirely conclusive to this point. As felicitous an instance of feudal classicism as can be well found, outside of the Far East, is the conventional spelling of the English language. A breach of the proprieties in spelling is extremely annoying, and will discredit any writer in the eyes of all persons who are possessed of a developed sense of the true and beautiful. English orthography satisfies all the requirements of the canons of reputability, under the law of conspicuous waste. It is archaic, cumbrous, and ineffective. Its acquisition consumes much time and effort. Failure to acquire it is easy of detection. Therefore, it is the first and readiest test of reputability in learning, and conformity to its ritual is indispensable to a blameless scholastic life. On this head of purity of speech, as at other points where a conventional usage rests on the canons of archaism and waste, the spokesman for the usage instinctively takes an apologetic attitude. It is contended in substance that a punctilious use of ancient and accredited locutions will serve to convey thought more adequately and more precisely than would be the straightforward use of the latest form of spoken English, whereas it is notorious that the ideas of today are effectively expressed in the slang of today. Classic speech has the honorific virtue of dignity. It commands attention and respect as being the accredited method of communication under the leisure class scheme of life, because it carries a pointed suggestion of the industrial exemption of the speaker. The advantage of the accredited locutions lies in their reputability. They are reputable because they are cumbrous and out of date, and therefore argue waste of time and exemption from the use and the need of direct and forcible speech. End of section 38. End of the theory of the leisure class by Thorsten Veblen.